This is Jocko Podcast number 426 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. Stop asking questions you can Google. We always seem to have enough to pay for war, but not enough to cover the cost. Tinnitus is the real sound of freedom. Reacher is an MP psyop. There might be an easier way to pay for college. I like my coffee black and my tea in the harbor. Mario is the original pipe hitter. I figured you'd like that one, Echo Charles. I do. <laughs> Leaders shouldn't imp- impose their opinion. Dear Navy, changing uniforms is not a suicide prevention plan. Drinking in the military made me the real liver king. (laughs) Compression shirts are just dude shapewear. Wearing gaiters doesn't make you a seal, but writing a book does. I still can't back up without a ground guide. S3 operations is where dreams go to die. Try not to get married over leave. (laughs) Not all who wander are lost, except the LT. Perfect PT scores don't make good leaders. Take Motrin, drink water, change your socks. You are not your mistakes. And those right there are some quotes from Zach Bell, who is known as, I would say even better known as, veteran with a sign. Zach was a Marine Corps rifleman who served with the 1-6 Marines and fought with those Marines through two deployments to Helmand Province, including the Battle of Garmsir and the Battle of Marja in 2010 in Afghanistan. And he learned a lot of lessons along the way through his experiences and eventually started to share those lessons that he learned, not through books, not through podcasts, not through videos, but he started to share those lessons learned through Sharpie pens and pieces of cardboard (laughs) and holding up signs written on cardboard And that's how he became known as the veteran with a sign. And it's an honor to have him with us here tonight to talk through some of those experiences and lessons learned. So, Zach, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I tried to get some of my uh, top veteran with a sign quotes. Yeah, I I just want to apologize for the Navy SEAL jokes now. (laughs) Oh, Um. (laughs) Navy SEALs deserve jokes. That's no you should factor. read the comments. It's a mixed bag. <laughs> um, no, it was just you know, uh, uh, I'm I'm actually impressed by the list. It's uh, it's it's robust. Well, yeah, and I mean, it, even though there's some seals that haven't written books, I've written enough books to make up for those guys. I think I think I'm getting <laughs> yeah. there at least. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're 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 leading the way. Yeah, you got that echelon front covered down. <laughs> yeah, we got that. We got that covered. Yeah. Uh, no, th- it, it, you really do. You do a great job, and the uh, the signs that you put up, and the the really, it's the topics that you bring to light through these quotes. Some of them are just funny. Some of them are very serious, and I think they're just they're just powerful. And obviously, they have made a mark on a lot of people, and they they transfer a good message to a lot of people. And and like I said, that message might be just a little bit of humor for the day, and it might be, hey, think about what's going on with this particular situation. So we'll get into all that, but let's just let's just kind of start at the beginning. So where were you born? I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. And what year? 1987. 1987? Yeah. Dang, okay. Yeah. That that really makes me feel old. <laughs> that, that does legit. Where That's were real. you in 87? Because I graduated high school in 1989. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, mm. th- that's that's pretty wild. Was so, that your rock band era? Well, yeah. So no, I was like getting ready to wait. Eighty seven. Oh yeah, I was going to hardcore shows, and I was 
uh, pretty much, yeah, singing in a hardcore band, playing bass too in a hardcore band, sometimes guitar, very yeah. poorly on, on all fronts. I feel like you're kind of still in your rock band era, by the way. But you know, hey, side note. Hey, let's face it. Hey, We're still real. on that get box from time to time. That's yeah, real. Let's That's go. Real. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and where? Memphis? Memphis, Tennessee, yeah. And so what was the family scenario growing up? Um, you know, it wasn't the best. It was it was complicated, to say the least. My my mom and dad got married when they were really young. Like how young? Um, 19, 20, I Check. believe. Uh my father uh, struggled with alcoholism his whole life, and uh, he was abusive as well. So uh, they, they split when I was really young. Like how young? Uh, I think three. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of memories of it. And, and was he around after that, or was he just gone? Just kind of on and off to kind of mm-hmm. offset the child support he would have to do. Mm-hmm. He'd have to pay. And, um, you know, my mom did the best she could. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did the best she could with me and my brother, but, you know, she had been through a lot. And, um, you know, it was, it was really hard. And, you know, just kind of did the best she could. So where did you do most of your growing up? I mean, uh, I like to, I like to really kind of, uh, think of it differently, but I was just kind of mischievous is probably mm-hmm. the best way to say it. I was a little bit of a scoundrel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my childhood, it was, is just, I mean, as a real latchkey kid kind of left, uh, to my own devices a lot. Um, and you said you had a brother, I have a little brother, but like a, a little brother. Yeah. A little brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so I was like, you know, I would take care of him and like, like we'd have uncles and stuff in and out. But like, for the most part, like we would do like a lot of, it's the South. So it's a lot of like church league stuff. So like do vacation Bible schools in the summer and different things like that. And then, you know, just like going to the church or like kind of moving around. It was kind of weird when I think about it, real kind of Peter Panny, if I'm being honest. What do you mean Peter Panny? Like, I just kind of felt like I was in charge of myself at way too oh. young of an age. Like, I didn't really have a lot of structure. I didn't really have a lot of people that were, like, looking out for me. And so, like, it was just kind of, like, it was my job to get up and go in the morning to, like, go to the bus stop and, you know, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then my mom would come home when she was done with work, and, like, that's when we would see her, and then I would get up in the morning. What did your mom do for work? Just different jobs, real uh-huh. estate, and, like, and I think she's in financial stuff now mm-hmm. and doing different things like that. So she was just figuring it out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really it's really really hard coming from a, a working class background when there's no there is no path that you're aware of mm-hmm. to like break that cycle of uh, a lot of its addiction and poverty. To mm-hmm. be honest, and um, the only thing that really helps people break that cycle usually is the military. Hell yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's legit. Hundred percent true. I think Jordan Peterson has a speech about it mm-hmm. about how it's the number one thing you can use to change your socioeconomic status. Like, Boom. And, um, you know, like my grandmother, I remember I was like, I want to go to college. And it's my great grandmother. She grew up during the depression and like jarred and pickled stuff her whole life because like they grew up without food. So like, she was like, it will happen again. And, um, and I don't blame, I mean, she was prepared. Like she was day one. (laughs) She's right. (laughs) Yeah, She was right. She was, she was not wrong. And, um, you know, and, uh, as a side note, she would always give us the same. She had so many grandchildren. She gave us the same gift every year, and it was underwear and socks. And that was she's like, just be prepared. And, <laughs> you know, you never know. And um, I told her I wanted to go to college, and she's like, don't do that. Choose a trade. Choose a trade. Choose. Wow. What choose, year did she tell you that? Two thousand, not two thousands, nineties. Mm-hmm. You know, she's like, choose a trade, stick with that, and That's things awesome like that. Advice, right? That's even more applicable today yes yeah. yes but she was like always do something you can do with your hands and always provide for yourself you know this is a woman who like gardened her whole life and did all these things like she used to make us pick blackberries and stuff to make jam out of mm-hmm. muscadine jelly have you ever had that i've not it's it's like a very specific southern thing um and so like Would that, you say muscadine yeah, jelly? Mus- yeah muscadine jelly yeah okay it's like a grape uh, i don't know I only know it like if it's around like Memphis butts up to Mississippi, so like around there. So, <laughs> okay. So, are you going to when you get to high school? Yeah. Like, are, do you stay in one consistent high school the whole time? No, I don't. What's <laughs> happening with I that? Ch- so, I change schools every year until my sophomore year. Mm-hmm. Um, because, like I said, my 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 home life is just chaotic. There's there's no other way around it. My mom was doing a lot of stuff to provide the best she could. She just didn't have the emotional or. Um, skills to be able to do it. Mm. And, um, you know, I try to have as much grace as I can looking back on that, but it's just as a parent, it's something that I don't understand. Mm. Um, cause like as a parent, you need to really develop a place for your child so they can, you know, thrive, become independent, strong, and then leave, which sucks. Mm-hmm. Cause that's your whole goal is to make them be strong enough to leave. But 
I don't know. It just, it just wasn't the environment I was raised in. So, um, I hopped around a few different schools, high schools, cause I was kind of a troublemaker. I think, I don't know what it was. I was just kind of always doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, I eventually ended up at a very, very small independent Baptist, uh, private school with a cl class of 28 people. And that's where I finished out my high school at. Were you playing sports or anything? I would try, but like, honestly, she would, we would, wouldn't pay dues or stuff. Or like, I was never in a school long enough to be there to be mm -hmm. consistent. I did wrestling one summer for a year. Um, Better like, than nothing. We'll tell you, you'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, it was, it was, it was great. It was great because like, um, it taught me, it taught me a lot. Like I remember like cutting weight and stuff. Like I did it all through eighth grade, um, through, um, most of my freshman year. And, uh, that was fun. So how that old were you? What what grade were you in when September 11th happened? Eighth grade. And what, do you remember it? Very clearly. What was going on? So I was, we were supposed to go to the bus. And um, so it's central time zone. So it had already happened around the time we were walking to the bus stop. And my mother called and she said, stay home. I don't know what's happening, but you have to stay home. Hmm. And I was like, okay. And she's like, turn on the TV, just stay home. And so I, I told my brother, like we were literally walking out the door. And um, I was like, sit down, and I turned on the TV, and I could see the one tower burning, and then I saw the second plane make impact yeah. live, and I was just like, oh, oh my god, like I, I can't, I can't, I can't believe this is happening, and like I just sat there like the rest of the world for forever. So you're in eighth grade when that happened? Yes, sir. What did you think, like in your eighth grade mind? What did you think was going to happen in the world once you realized that was a terrorist attack? Um, that's a very, very good question. Um, you guys should stick with this podcast and stuff. Um, <laughs> no. So what's, what's interesting about that time is the internet's kind of developing then mm -hmm. around eighth grade. So I, we had a laptop with, I mean, a laptop, we had a desk, like a family computer mm -hmm. that was used for like work and stuff and to type things on. And so there is that small amount of disruption that's happening with like information and stuff. So the world was becoming smaller, but until that moment, New York was just a place that I'd only seen in movies. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have that direct connection of like, that's my country. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, I, was just, I was just a kid. And then when I realized that another entity had attacked my country, I just remember being like, this is not going to stand. Like, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, I want to fight. Yeah. I, I, I could just feel it. I, I like it. It's not that New York wasn't a part of my life before. It's just like I, I just it just seemed to, almost imaginary to me because it was just outside of my my realm. And then like I was like, someone attacked America. No, that's not happening. So I never really thought through this before. So when the first Gulf War kicked off, I was in the well. I joined the Navy as that was happening, and so I'm in the Navy when we're massing troops on the border and. We're gonna go to war with Iraq is like what the word is because yeah. they had invaded Kuwait. We're gonna go help them. So this is in my mind. I thought, oh, this is exactly what happened with World War Two. Mm -hmm. You know, like oh, the Nazis roll into Czechoslovakia, they roll into Poland, we go to war. This is four years of just total destruction of the world. Yeah, I thought that's what was about to happen. Mm -hmm. And the news reports were that there was gonna be forty thousand U.S. casualties in the first forty-eight hours. I remember watching that, and I'm like, okay, cool. Like we're, I was kind of. You know, because when you're young, you mm -hmm. you just want to go to war and everything. So I was kind of like, okay, well, this is gonna be yeah, this is gonna be my life and and death most likely. Let's go. And then you found so the that war lasts seventy two hours. So yeah. then when when nine eleven happens, I was actually in college at the time. I was in the navy, but I was I was active duty going to college because I'd been commissioned. And I didn't have a degree. So when that happened, I thought, oh. I wish I'm gonna miss this. It's gonna be, you know, some strikes will happen. I didn't think that we were gonna do what we did at such a level. I definitely didn't think, oh, this is gonna be, here we're facing two decades worth of war, which is what we were about to do. We were about to do 20 years of war. And I thought we had, I thought it was gonna be two months, three months, like maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. We'd do some targeted strikes. We'd kill a bunch of terrorists with bombs. Maybe like maybe there'd be some special operations that would happen. I thought I was gonna miss the whole thing Which actually looking back that sounds like a really good plan <laughs> You yeah. know a really good plan like hey We're gonna bomb the shit out of some places that have terrorists in them and we're gonna 
keep a closer watch on him and not let him do anything like that again. Seems like a good, pretty good plan looking back. So it's just interesting. I, I can't imagine if when I was in eighth grade, mm-hmm. if something like that happened, I, I would have thought it would have been World War II because I even thought the first Gulf War was going to be a significant, at, at a minimum, I thought the first Gulf War was going to be like Korea or Vietnam. I thought we had three, four years of, of near peer competition on the battlefield like mm-hmm. i thought hey it's the iraqis they have tanks they have soldiers they've got a big army this is going to be a war and it just wasn't it just wasn't a thing so yeah yeah your perception can be very strange when you're young well it's it's interesting you say that my uncle was in the first Gulf war okay and he was in the marines and uh he had, he never really talked about it but he had he had he would be like it was just he once said a joke. He's like, I was on leave longer than I was in war. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay. And so, like, I I, I, I remember thinking that. And I was like, that that makes sense. But, like, even in eighth grade, like, I, I, I just – it was the way people were talking. Like, that I, I – I don't want – this sounds – probably should – it felt in the moment like it was the Pearl Harbor of oh, the modern 100%. era. 100%. Because – you couldn't, I just remember being like, you couldn't escape it. Like I would roll to other channels yeah. and they were still talking about it. And then the other things that happened very similarly to Pearl Harbor is like, those aren't French fries. Those mm-hmm. are freedom fries. Like all these like weird little yeah. things, <laughs> you know, the Dixie chicks got yeah. canceled. Like Toby yeah. Keith did all the stuff he is doing. Where were you when the world stopped turning? Like all this stuff, like it just seemed like lights turned on in a house. Yeah. And even though I just said hundred percent seemed like Pearl Harbor, I, I said that too quickly because it seemed like Pearl Harbor, but I thought, the response would be some airstrikes, maybe maybe some quick ground operations. But but the last time we were at war in in the first Gulf War, mm-hmm. it was seventy two hours long. Mm-hmm. And so I thought to myself, okay, this is going to be very fast. I was in college. I was like, I'm going to miss this thing. And I called the officer detailer, who was a friend of mine. I said, Hey, sir, please get me back to a team. And he said to me, This is going to last a long time. Really? And I didn't believe him. And I said, I'll go to college when I'm old, please. <laughs> and he said, no, you finish out. And I didn't have much longer to finish out. So I finished out, went to a team, and I was in Iraq a few months later. But Wow. Yeah, yeah. But I did not think it was going to be what it was. And and if you look at it, you know, now that you look at things, now that I'm older, look at things with a more strategic perspective, that the first Gulf War, they had a very clear objective. It was just to get the Iraq, get Iraqis, get the Iraqi government and military out of Kuwait. Mm-hmm. Did that, and like, okay, we're done. And that was that. When we went into Iraq the second time, it was like, what was the goal? What was the, what was the objective? What, can, you, can you explain that to me? And no one was asking those questions. There was no real clear mission. And so what you end up with is just mission creep over a long extended period of time. And we had the disease of victory because the first Gulf War was over so quickly, and. Grenada was over quickly and Panama was over quickly. So I had those things in my brain too Mm -hmm. that when when 9-11 happened, I thought, yeah, this will be, this isn't gonna be, I definitely, if I would have had to put money on it, Put 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 money on two decades worth of war, I never would have guessed that. I don't think anybody would have. Unless I would have added the calculus of bad leadership into the equation, which I didn't understand as well at the time, now, when things happen, the the biggest uh, factor in my equation is bad leadership. Like when when things are happening globally, I just put bad leadership as the biggest number in the equation. Mm-hmm. It's the he- most heavily weighted uh, number in the equation. Is yeah, we're gonna have leaders that make dumb decisions, and so if you think something's gonna go relatively smoothly, inject bad leadership, and then you're gonna get a different outcome than you anticipate. So that's a, that's a good formula. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it makes sense. Yeah. So did your, did your uncle influence you at all as you, as you started, you know, thinking about the military? Um, well he did. He had, I mean, he was probably the most consistent male role model, like outside of like Han Solo and Indiana Jones <laughs> and Doc Holliday in my life. Uh, you know, I know both two of them are Harrison Ford characters, but they're different people. Yeah. Um, um, and, uh, he had, I mean, because he he was my uncle. He came from the same background I did, and he went on to you know go to med school and stuff. And he was the one who talked to me about the GI Bill and all these things. And like, I can't stress enough. I was just talking to uh, Chris Chris Craighead about this, is that the military gets such a bad rap 
um, in the sense of like, there is this wild, great adventure that can literally change your family for generations. And it's right ahead of you. And you don't have to go to war to do that. But like the, the gift of service that you get, of, you know, I always say that like, I find the best version of myself in the service of others. And like, you get that when you join the military. And then also you can like, go to college, start a family, like all these things can happen from it. But it's just not viewed that way anymore. Mm-hmm. It's kind of um, disheartening. And uh, it's a weird too when you're younger, when someone's younger and like I was 18 when I joined the military mm-hmm. and for the program that I did, it was a six year commitment to go to the team, to go to, to go, to get a chance to go to buds was a six year commitment. So I was like, okay, that's what we're doing. But if you think about that, that's like what one third of the time of my life when I was 18 was another six years. It seemed like a long time. It didn't seem like long to me cause I was, I was thinking I was going to do 50 years. Like mm-hmm. as long as you can stay in, that's what I'm doing. But if you're if you're thinking, oh, I want to get some college money or whatever, but it's going to cost me four years. And the other thing that people miss out on is they think all of the entire time in the military is like boot camp, which yes, it's not. It's not you after boot camp. You begin to be treated more like a human, <laughs> and and actually substantially more as you you know as you're in longer and all that stuff. Yeah. So your uncle was telling you a little bit about the Marine Corps. Yeah, and what did he do in the Marine Corps? Um, I believe he was Motor T. Just just getting after that motor team. He, he went oh, open yeah. contract. I mean, yeah. it was, I mean, when he went in, it was the days of like, they just kind of stamped you on the arm. I was going to say, when yeah. he went in, there <coughs> that's what there was. Yeah. You were going to get, you were going to do what the Marine Corps told you to do. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't have that adjustment where now you can actually have a little bit more job You selection. can pick a field. Yeah. That's, that's as narrow as it gets. Yeah. And the field's wide and, you know, you can try and influence it, but he was, he was open contract and. You know, he, he went on to become a surgeon, all these different things. And so, like, I had seen that firsthand. And, you know, um, you know, after 9-11 going into high school and stuff, like, I, you know, I thought about college. But, like, I did a semester at the University of Memphis. It didn't stick. Mm-hmm. I don't want to brag here, but I had a 1.67 GPA. <laughs> so You were on the path. <laughs> I, was, I was on a path. I was on a path. It just wasn't a good one. It was not a righteous one. So it was one semester you did. That was one semester um, because I was still what I I was like flirting with the idea because I was I was this is two again so this is now jump cut we're in two thousand seven mm-hmm. Iraq's really going you're probably on your like four hundred thousandth mission by that point <laughs> and um, but like what's also happening to my generation is live leak and all of the videos all of that stuff is flooding the world. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's what you get to do? Like, that's what happens? And it's just like, boom, boom, boom. And then the guy goes, boom, and like a, a 40 mic mic comes mm-hmm. out, and you're like, oh, that, that's what I want, that's what I want, that's what I want. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm seeing that stuff, and even then, my, my cousin, who was, he was about four years older than me, uh, Mitch Cannon, uh, he, was, uh, he had gone to uh, Fallujah, and he was an AAV mechanic, and I believe it was um, the second push through. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I was just in a jump seat. And then they started losing guys. And then he was stacking mm-hmm. on doors. And so he like, and to see him, he had, he had ribbon. He had more ribbons than my drill instructors. I remember this, mm-hmm. but he was like big and burly and stood up straight and had a, has a sergeant rank on him. And I was like, dude, there's something, I, yep. you know, you see him, right? Yeah. You're like, yeah, kind of, <laughs> I kind of want that. But I had still not committed. Mm-hmm. I still not committed. So I did a semester, got that 1.67. And then, you know, I was like, I, I think it's, I had already gone to the recruiter and they didn't even have to try. I just walked in and said, my name's Zachary Bell. I want to be a, a rifleman in the United States Marine Corps. And they go, whoa, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> whoa. And then, you know, I took the ASVAB. I, I did well enough to do whatever I wanted. And um, I was like, O three 3 infantry. We're not, we're not messing around. I want to be a rifleman. Put me on the front. Well, you can do, they, you know, they pitch you on like, you can do this. It's kind of whatever, you know, every Marine's a rifleman. That's it's not, it's not true. Um, that's not to say that every Marine doesn't have rifle training, mm-hmm. that there's a difference, but there is the trade craft associated with being a combat infantry rifleman. And that was my job day in and day out. Yeah. What you is know? the big difference between a rifleman and a combat infantry rifleman? Yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> like, cause if, if that, if everyone's a rifleman, then everyone's a mechanic, then everyone's a pilot yeah. and everyone's this and that, but yeah. they weren't asking me to fix the helos, <laughs> you know, they were asking me to locate and close with, and that's what I wanted to do. So how long did it take you to get processed? And yeah, 2000. So my last deployment was in 2006. Yeah. And, and we kinda, we kinda just were a little bit behind like every single guy in a platoon having a helmet cam and a, mm-hmm. and a GoPro and all that. So we didn't have, we didn't have that. 
We yeah. had like a couple guys that the, got issued helmet cams for some like experimental mm-hmm. things. So, so we didn't really have that. We didn't, yeah, we just didn't have it. And, but yeah, the following deployments, like you start talking about 2007 to now yeah. all of a sudden every freaking guy had a GoPro attached to his weapon and his helmet yeah. fo- facing two directions. Mm-hmm. So you started getting some seriously first person observation of what was going down. It was incredible. Mm-hmm. It was incredible. <laughs> and like the internet, for all the stuff that it has now with regulation, that didn't exist then. Mm-hmm. Which I'm I don't know how I feel about that, but like it was like if you if you wanted to see something, you went to Live Leak or like there was E bombs. Is or, Live Leak still around? I don't I don't think it is. Mm-hmm. Um I think it's just Twitter now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you you can just go anywhere and see stuff now. But I just remember like typing up stuff like the Battle of Fallujah, the Battle of Ramadi, mm-hmm. and you could just see a guy be like, right, you know, and they're just like doing it. Mm-hmm. And it just, I was like, that's that's what I want. That's that's what I wanted. And they didn't have to try. I So, um, how long was it before you shipped out? Like 30 days from the time I, not 30 days. Um, I think when I, so I left, I officially enlisted in February of 2007. So, like, maybe. I was still in college, so let's say October's when I committed to the DEP, mm-hmm. and they like gave me a date, and I was like, let's do that. Let's okay. Do that. So you had a pretty good length of time hanging around. Did you do anything to prepare? Did you run or anything? Do push ups or anything no. like that? No. I mean, a little bit. They had like the pulleys and stuff that were doing, but to be honest, I was I was more concerned with spending time with my girlfriend, who mm-hmm. would who would later become my wife, and uh, you know, she was the one who had actually told me. You know, my wife, Christy, had told me, like, from the very beginning that she thought that I could do it. You know, mm-hmm. she thought that, you know, I could serve in the Marines. A lot of people didn't. A lot of people in my life were like, ah, you're not going to do it. Because, I mean, it is war. People were dying and stuff. But, like, I couldn't. There was this thing inside me, this fire that was burning that I, I literally couldn't mm-hmm. deny it. And, um, I mean, we so we'd actually met through her cousin, mm-hmm. right? Her cousin um, came home before his deployment to Iraq in 2006 for his father's 50th birthday. And I'd known this family for such a long time and they're, they're very good people. And, um, it was a surprise for his dad. And so I went and picked him up at the airport and I came in brought him and they were like, Oh yeah, it's like this big surprise. And I look across this room and there's this gorgeous, absolute bombshell Mm -hmm. of a girl. And I go up to Luke and I go, Hey, Luke, my brother in Christ, I introduce you to every person that's cool. Like, who is that? Like, and he's like, oh, that's my cousin. That's my cousin, Christy. She lives in Nashville. And I go, your cousin, Christy, lives in Nashville. I've known you for quite a long time. We've never talked about your cousin, Christy, that lives in Nashville. And he goes, well, I don't think you were ready for it. And I go, well, you're probably right. I tell you what, though, I'm going to marry that girl. And I, and I did. Damn. Yeah. How long was it that you knew her or that you were, like, going out with her before you got married? Here. A year. So were you married before you left in the Marine Corps? Um, no, we got engaged uh, okay. not long after I enlisted and then married after that. But, okay. But so, when you know, you know. I don't, you know, we've been married since 2007, mm-hmm. you know. And um, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't recommend anything for anybody. I just know that, like, when I saw her, when when I was with her, I, I knew I, I always wanted to be the best. I always wanted to be the best version of myself when I was around her. And I was like, that's got to be what true love is. Mm-hmm. Well, you're still you're still at it with her, so that's a good sign. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. I don't know why. I, I, maybe yeah. she's like, you know, I, I'm a real DIY project, I, I think. <laughs> but um, you know, you know. Jack. guys are really laughing about that. <laughs> yeah. So <coughs> you you leave for boot camp. Mm-hmm. How's boot camp? Shock? Are you good? No, I mean, so like uh, boot camp stories. I always I always do like an eye roll and people have them, but like. I found it to be the most hysterical, entertaining time <laughs> of my life up to that point. Uh, what's the language? I don't, can I swear? Can say whatever I want? Of course. Um, like, I just, the things they would say, I felt like they were stand up comedians. Mm-hmm. They'd be like, look at this fucking guy right here. <laughs> you know, like, and they would tear into people, and I would just be like looking ahead because it's, you know, People get too wrapped around the axle of like they don't, you know, they don't want you know recruit well to fail. Like they think that it's they want you to fail. They don't. They really want you to succeed, but they are trying to push you. Like I had this one guy next to me who was thirty when he enlisted, and he, Damn. yes, and he he just got torn up from the floor up all the time. <laughs> he was not in the best shape, and they they were on him like a dog on a bone. Like they could. <laughs> 
I don't want to say his name at all, but or even allude to it. But like they were like, "Hey, hey, recruit so and so, you you look so fucking gross. You disgust me. I don't even know why anyone would ever be the Lord have mercy. This recruit doesn't know either. And like he would just he would feed into it and he'd be like, "You, oh my God, you smell like you smell like death. I tell you what, you're gonna get run over as soon as you get to Iraq if you even go. You coward. Like just boom, 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 boom. And like he ate it up. But um, I was in a rare situation where um, you know I was much lighter than I am now. I was like one seven, one ten. Going oh, in, dang, yeah, oh yeah. Did then did that bring you extra focus? The extra focus was they made me a double ration in so boot camp. They feed you more, and that was hard. That was actually hard for the first month, and then after that, a part of me like engaged in my head that I didn't mm. know existed. But like when I left boot camp, I was like one forty five, and like Damn. I was eating, I was drinking two glasses of milk every meal. Like literally, they would give me cake every every like every meal and I had to eat it and so I sat down first what do they how do they explain that to you what do they say to you and they just look at me and they go what the fuck <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know they, they were like what's wrong with you and I was like I don't know I was 18 I mean like mm-hmm. I just you know, I was just kind of like scrawny I, I don't I don't know I was you know I had been doing fitness and stuff like that Dude, 107 pounds I mean, I mean that's, like like, that's like a wrestling weight for guys that are just naturally really small so like humans i that's really why when i was in like eighth and ninth grade the wrestling coach had come up to me because mm-hmm. like i was you know, i'm five five seven on a good day you know and um like i'm always at that time especially i'm leaner in general mm-hmm. right and so it's like one seven one ten ish i remember something around there because they were just like looking at me like oh my god <laughs> like i was just lean and um they uh like you know you do like the indoc stuff like you stand over like you, so you go through receiving when you get there and you like get all your stuff and they're like hey you know this this here is this here are called you know go fasters they do the what i, I call it world building when you first get there because they teach you like a pen's not a pen it's an ink stick mm-hmm. you know when they do those things because they're terror they're terraforming mm-hmm. right you know tennis shoes are go fasters mm-hmm. you know this here is the bulkhead this here's you know mm-hmm. the deck all those things and um Blouse, camis, trousers, blah, 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 blah. And so I was standing over the thing and like going through medical and they, you know, they give me the shot and they go, how much do you weigh? And I, I remember I like went in there at like 110, but I was like 17 by that point. Cause I've been up for a few days and you're not eating. And they're like double rat. And I was like, what does that mean? And they're like, you eat first and you eat all of it. And that's all they said to me. And I was like, okay. Do they put a sign on you or something? I had to wear a tag. I had to wear a tag. No kidding. Because the, because every, everyone wants it. Oh, yeah. Right? Because most people don't have that problem. Yeah. Most people they're they're cutting. Like my <laughs> my thirty year old friend, he he would have he he's would the have other end of the spectrum. He was the <laughs> other end. What of the do spectrum. they call him? Uh, he's like private pile, right? No, they called him fat body. They called oh, him gross. Yeah, all of it. You know, this is what they called him. Don't cancel me. This is what they called yeah, him, yeah. not me. Um, but you like, you are a disgusting fat body. Yeah, you make me sick. <laughs> I don't know why a woman would ever be like literally. And I would just stand there and just be like. <laughs> And like I broke a few times and I got popped for it, but that's all right. <laughs> um, but like, so I would go in there and the boot camp chow hall ladies are ruthless. Like they're like, what do you want recruit? And they just like scoop it and they throw it at you. But I was always the first one that they would see. So I'd have my little tag that I would like put on my blouse and I would put on my button and it would say double rat, you know, bell Z, whatever in my mm-hmm. information. And they would look at it and they would like scoop it and they would be very like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And so, but it's, it was a race for me. It was a race because I got punished if I didn't finish everything. That was what was worse. Mm-hmm. So, you know, desserts every, every meal, big glasses of milk every meal, whatever entree that I don't remember. And I'm just, I'm literally just picking it up with my one hand, one's down here and I'm just... <laughs> Hurry up, hurry up, Bell. Ooh, I bet you like that, don't you, boy? I bet you like that cake, huh? Ooh, and just like, there's, there's for crew, don't you talk? That's Were disgusting. Were you getting stronger, too? Like Everything was happening. It mm-hmm. was like I was in a montage for an 80s movie. It was insane. <laughs> it was literally, it was, I, it was like I learned about nutrition for the first time ever. Like, you know, I came in there, I think I did like 12 pull-ups or something like that. Um, by the time I left, I was... You know, the Marine Corps PT test at that time was 20 pull-ups, uh, three-mile run, 18 minutes, and then 100 sit-ups. And when I left there, it was either 17 or 18 pull-ups I did, and I, I got a first class. But, mm-hmm. And then my goal after that physically was, like, I will get 20 pull-ups. And, like, you know, when you're working out in fitness or anything, as you, as you both know, you have these goals, and then, like, you chase them forever, and then when you're not looking, you end up getting them, is it, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And it was, like, the first time I was, like, oh, like, I'm, I'm strong, like, and I'm different, and, mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm bigger. Like, it was, it was, it was insane.
So the Marine Corps turned you into a man straight up. That's what the Marine Corps does. Yeah, they did. They yeah. don't play around. I, I can't recommend it enough. Yeah. So you, you and this is all at Paris Island because you're Paris discussed. Island. Yeah. Uh, you graduate from boot camp. Yes. So February, what's three months later? Mm -hmm. uh, May, right? Mayish, right? Sure. Something, something like that. Because I remember I got it. Yeah, Mayish, and then they're like, you know, you graduate boot camp. My wife's there. Um, so you're married now. No, not it's okay. not my wife. It's my, she's my girlfriend, okay. and um, you know we uh, she like sees me, and I remember like she was like, "Wow, you look different." And I was like, "Yeah," <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, get you get your ten days of leave. We hung out every bit of it, and then they're like, "Hey, you're off to the School of Infantry, Camp Geiger, North Carolina." Check. And uh, you know, I got dressed in my pickle suit. That's what we call the the alphas. You know, the, oh, the yeah, cover, yeah. and yeah. and um, went there and went to the School of Infantry. And that's when, like, all my friends who were, like, you know, uh, non-combat jobs or non-infantry jobs, they, mm -hmm. like, went to MCT, which is 21 days of them being in the field. And then I went for, like, three months, basically. I mean, not, I can't remember how long it is, actually. And and when you're at School of Infantry, you're trained to be a rifleman. What's the, what's like the... What's the day-to-day -day looking like? So what happens at first, there's like a receiving week thing, and then you get an introduction to all the different instructors, and you take like an aptitude test of some sort. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way it works is you're like in this big like amphitheater, and there's these different instructors based on the MOS. So there's 0311 infantry rifleman, 0331 machine gunner, 0341 uh, mortarman, um, 0351 assaultman, and uh, there's tow gunners, but they weren't there. Mm -hmm. And so what they do is they like. What's the assault man? The assault man, uh, they had the small, and they were like a demos, a demo uh, expert that would be attached to like. Got it. It's mainly a weapons platoon job that they would like attach mm -hmm. to like you know do shape charges and stuff. Check. So, but it doesn't exist anymore. Um, the tow gunner, I think, still exists. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but the way it works is they're like, all right, which job do you want to pick? You like list or whatever, and then all the like heads of the class will come out and be like. Hey, my name's Sergeant So and So. I'm an O three fifty one. Do you like shooting rockets? Do you like do you like fucking explosions? <laughs> I'm your guy, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, oh, that's cool. O three forty one. Hey, my name's O. You know, Sergeant whatever. I'm an O three forty one. You like playing spades? You like dropping rounds? Come over here with the mortarman. We'll have a good time, <laughs> right? And then you know, there's hey, my name's Sergeant So and So. I'm a machine gunner, and they look they look like fullbacks. Yeah, they're all jacked. Yeah, they're all like. You like you like reaching out and taking the beaten out of the round and touching the enemy. You come over here with a man, <laughs> and it's just like everybody's like, Ugh, yeah, and everybody's like riled up. And I'll never forget. I can't remember his name, but I wish I did. Let's say his name's Sergeant Johnson. Sergeant Johnson comes up there and he looks around. And he goes, <sighs> takes out a dip, puts a dip in. He goes, you want to be in charge of those dumbasses? You be in O three eleven. Come to my class. Yeah. And that, that's all I wrote down on my paper was O three eleven, and I just <laughs> gave it to him. And away I went. Not like I had any idea over it, yeah. but I was like, I'm not giving them an option. <laughs> so that's that's what I did. And how was that school? School, I mean, school's great. I mean, but it's like anything else. You don't really learn the trait to get to your unit. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, you're just doing hikes, like, a, you know, 5K, 10, 15, 20. Um, you're trying to learn stuff. You're basically, a, this is where like the real stuff of like team wedge, squad column, stuff like that starts to come into your mind. Are you getting opportunities to lead patrols? Are you, yeah, are they, they sometimes like, all right, you're in charge, you're in charge, like at Ranger School, where they, you get rotated through leadership positions? They do, but it's it's not as like formalized mm -hmm. as that because it's such a big class and you don't really even understand what's happening at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, you're, just like, oh. you're just like trying not to, you're, you're only, you're really upset that it's still kind of like boot camp, mm -hmm. right? And you're just trying to not mess up and then get to Liberty on the weekend. Like mm -hmm. that's your whole goal. But like, it's just, you're just How much hugs. Liberty would you get? Would you get like Friday night, Saturday night? Yeah, and then come back Sunday morning. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and you're like going out. And what was the freaking trouble level for the boys after <sighs> boot camp? And then now they're there and now they get Liberty on the weekends. They're going out with a fat wallet full of cash. I mean, how they keep guys out of trouble? They don't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I yeah. mean, like you, you have like a buddy system, and you travel with like your friends and stuff. I mean, a good friend of mine, he went to Winston Salem with a, a dude in our platoon because his fam. This guy said he's like, come out. My family's got all this stuff or whatever, and they went to Winston Salem, and the other Marine just didn't come back, and it was his ride back. <laughs> so, like, and he called the he called the unit was I mean SOI was like, hey, I'm I'm stuck. I'm stuck in Winston Salem, North Carolina. I I can't come back. Can y'all like not like mark me a wall or whatever? And his name's Ace, and 
Brian Archer, he would call him Ace, and I was like, Ace, where are you? Like, I'm texting him. I was like, where are you? He's like, I'm stuck here. So-and-so won't come back. Like, it's a whole thing. And they eventually got him, and, like, they put him away for a little bit, and I think they separated him. I don't know what happened, but, like, that's that's what would happen. Yeah. Like, weird stuff like that. But Were you, since you had a girlfriend at the mm-hmm. time, were you drinking and stuff, or were you just... Oh, <laughs> Yeah, Jack. Hey, <laughs> I mean, you know, there are guys that r- recognize and very few, very few. So you were just wrapped up full on. Let's go. I mean, like we're hanging out with the boys and yeah. stuff. But like, so what was different is my cousin was still in and he picked me up. And when he showed up, he was like, what? <laughs> like he was a sergeant and he had deployed more than most of the people that were there at that point. Mm-hmm. And at that time as in the military, if you deployed, you were... <sighs> That was that was currency. Mm-hmm. If you had a combat action ribbon, that was didn't really nobody. Yeah, because this you. is now is this now oh eight two oh, two seven uh, two thousand seven going into oh eight yeah two thousand seven yeah. yeah. So you still had guys that hadn't deployed yet. Yeah, yeah. There was like that weird kind of lull because y'all had just left Iraq and yeah. like it was becoming the green zone and all mm-hmm. those things were happening. And so uh, he would pick me up and we would hang out and like my uh, my girlfriend wife my wife girlfriend at the time would like come through and we would just like go to movies and do stuff and like hang out with my friends mm-hmm. and then so you were a little bit more chill yeah I mean not as chill as I was when I got to my unit but mm-hmm. yeah I mean that's that's really where like you hang out with the boys a lot and you're doing a lot of that stuff there. was there anything that was a challenge for you at SOI um. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, because honestly, what I love about the military is how clear and concise it is when you get out of your own way of like, this is the task we have to accomplish. Yeah. Do that. Yeah, I I always feel that way about the Marine Corps. Like, um, and I don't, I, I can speak for SEAL training. SEAL mm-hmm. training is freaking crazy. Like in terms of you just having bad luck and everything falls apart. Yeah. Like you get hurt. You, it, there's some people that just don't aren't good in the water. There's some people that sink. There's some people that they, they just have problems. Yeah, and you're untrainable. You're untrainable, and you're just not going to make it. Yeah, and it seems like the Marine Corps does a much better job of taking someone that's whatever you are, 18 years old, mm-hmm. 107 pounds, yeah, was light. and with no training whatsoever, and turning that guy into a combat infantry rifleman. That's yeah. what that's what they do. They do it all the time. We're the best at it. I agree. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> no, it's. I mean, in, in in SOI, it's really just about getting you to your unit because your unit is where they're really gonna like separate you. Yeah. Put you in your different companies, your different platoons. You know, if you're not good, they're gonna push you up to battalion. You know, you'll push papers while I'm pushing rounds. You know, that's that's just the way it goes. But as far as like getting you to the place where like they're creating a product, like they're really really mm-hmm. good about that. And the God's honest truth is, it's not that complicated. Mm-hmm. You're just walking in a circle, dude. You know. <laughs> Like, I mean, that's all you did. That's all I did. We walked in circles, right? Mm -hmm. You know, there's different ways we got there. But at the end of the day, checkpoint one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, or two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Like, that's just it. Route one, route two. Like, Mm -hmm. but you don't even know any of that stuff yet. You're just like (laughs) team wedge squad. Like, you're just like doing the hand signals or like on me. And like, that's the stuff they're teaching you there. Like trying to like really learn stuff that you'll probably carry on. Yeah. You know, I had uh, James Webb on the podcast (laughs) Mm -hmm. and it was wild because he went like graduated from the academy went to um the basic school Mm -hmm. and then went to officer infantry school and then i think 12 days of leave yeah got to vietnam it got they pointed they drove him out or took him out on patrol pointed up at a ridge and was like hey your platoon's up there he went up there there was no one to relieve the guy that he was taking the place of had been wounded and gone so it was like a platoon sergeant that was running it and he's in charge now and that that night they got into like a big contact and he was calling for fire and supporting arms and i asked him i was like, i said were you ready and he said yes which is freaking impressive mm-hmm. for someone to come out of officer candidate training or you know whatever uh officer infantry training and then show up and just be in combat ready to roll and executing so the Marine Corps does a damn good job. They do. It's the perks of being like, uh, you know, a quarter of the size of the army. Mm-hmm. We're real reduced. We're small. We're focused. Like it's the Marine Corps lives and dies off a of small unit leadership and building into the aspects that you need to be trained for the job ahead of you. And the person needs to be trained. Like it's mm-hmm. you're like always looking down and looking up. Right. Mm-hmm. So you're training to be up and ready for the guys coming to replace you. And it's like that at all levels. You know, I mean, every every infantry officer we had that came out, especially during that time, they were ridiculous. 
especially the Navy guys. There's a few dudes who like want to do buds or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what happened, but they would always come out and they're just like jacked. They're kind of what you want to see as an infantry <laughs> platoon commander. Like you, the ones that always I didn't like were the lean ones. Cause that means they were just going to yeah, run into, rock, yeah. yeah, they're going to run until you're, you're vomiting, mm-hmm. you know, like you're just like, come on, come on, sir. <laughs> like, come on, let's not do this. But, um, no, it was, you know, that was, it's, it's all like fun, but like, when I got to, <laughs> when they came to pick us up and they they showed up in the buses and they're looking around, they go, you, whatever, you, whatever. And they looked at me in my group and they go, one, six, get on the bus. And I was like, okay. And I got on the bus and I had never. So this seen, is when you graduated. This is when we graduate SOI. It's, there's not a lot of pomp and Do you sir. get orders? Do you get orders? We were, the orders were, this group goes to one, six. This one goes to eight. This one goes to like whatever. That's mm-hmm. as far as it goes, right? You get told what battalion you're going to. And like we did a little ceremony, they're like, class, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Get out of here, you get a paper, get out, mm-hmm. leave. Cool. Roger that. Um, bus comes by. Some of the like NCOs were tasked with it who were upset that they were tasked with it, came to pick us up. And then it's we drove on to Camp Lejeune and I had seen it before, but I'd never seen it, see if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then like we just start doing, you know, we go to SIF, which is there's a big debate over that. Do you know this? No. That um what do you call it? Where you get your gear? Do you call it SIF or CIF? Uh, I guess we would just call it supply. Well, we would yeah. call it. So people, every time I say it's called SIF, people are like, "It's CIF," because oh, okay. that's what the Army calls it. You know, Central Issue Facility. And we always called it SIF. Well, I was saying FOB. Yeah. And I said FOB to a Vietnam <laughs> uh, SOG guy, mm-hmm. and he's like, "What? It's it's." I was like, "FOB," and he's like, "Oh, FOB." Yeah. So they didn't call it FOB. So I now I call it FOB. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm on board with the boys. <laughs> Did he know? call you a boot after? He's you know, like, I am a boot. Yeah. Those dudes, yeah. You know? He's like, all right, Jocko, you boot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those guys oh, were next level. For so. sure. But like we go there, you get your mm-hmm. gear, all that stuff. You get your gas mask. What does CIF stand for? Central uh, Issue Facility. Okay. But yeah. we call it SIF. That's that's mm-hmm. what I was told. I mean, you don't know. Some guys like get in line at SIF. It's where you turn in your gear. It's where you get your gear and you turn in. And they would like look at like whenever you leave, they're like, this uh, pack's been worn. And you're like, yeah. And they're mm-hmm. like, $200, whatever it is. But they give you all the stuff that you never use because you end up buying better stuff, especially during that time. Mm-hmm. And um, I just remember, they're like, okay, you're going to your unit. And then we go to like the battalion office and the, all my friends, literally all of them except one other dude, they're like, Charlie, Bravo, Charlie, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. It's like a draft, mm-hmm. a draft of dum-dums is what I called it. So they're like, Alpha, Bravo, and like they hit me, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie. All my friends go over there, and me and like three other people go to Alpha Company. We're dragging our gear, and as we're doing it, the Marines had just got back from the field, and they're throwing everything they can at us, catcalling us. It was terrifying. Mm-hmm. They're like, woo, boots, hurry the fuck up. Just everything they can as we're just like, you're looking up and, you know, these are campus Hume barracks. They, you know, they've just got trauma and mold in them. <laughs> like, and so they're just like screaming at us, you hurry up, run. And like, it's for like the first week, it was a nightmare. Mm-hmm. It was an absolute nightmare. And one six was just coming back from Ramadi. They had been back. For, they had just got back from leave and it was, they had, it was worse. Yeah. They had just got back from leave and they had just got back from the field. So it was their first post leave field op. They're sweaty and they're just like, <laughs> sweaty and yeah, pissed. yeah. <laughs> there's like animals that have been let loose yeah. and your boots, you haven't deployed anywhere and they hate you. <laughs> so like it's, it's a lot. Yeah. So when I was in Ramadi, it was, I was with three, eight for the beginning mm-hmm. and then one six came and took their place probably about a month before I left. Yeah. So this was like, they did that. They did their six, seven month tour or whatever yes. and then came home and yeah. So you were, they were definitely they were definitely rowdy. They were rowdy. <laughs> Two hundred ten days. That's what they always say. That's what you're down. So it's like seven months. But like they were rowdy. And then you're just you have no idea what's happening. You just see a sea of people. They're all dressed like you. They're like different versions of you. You know what I'm saying? Like all military people are kind of like we're all different versions of the same person. Is what I say. Um, but I'm looking for my team leader. That's all I'm looking for. I'm looking for my team leader. Find Kelly. Find Kelly. Lance Corporal. Ke- Where's Lance Corporal Kelly? And this guy comes up to me, big dip in. He goes, Hey, I'm Lance Corporal Kelly. Don't make my life hard or I'll make yours hard. Good to go? And I was like, good to go, Lance Corporal. And he goes, all right, don't fuck up. <laughs> and like he was gone. Mm-hmm. Like he was just gone. Your room is this room. Boom, boom, boom. Went to my room, sat down, and just that whole night, seniors banging, get out of here, boots. Get out of here. Pick this up. Boom, boom, boom. You know, plotting points on a ga- and on the sh- ga- plotting points on a map with a gas mask on in the shower, running around. 
I don't want to use the word hazing. It was training. There was training that was happening. So individualized training. Very individualized. <laughs> it seemed like it was only like 12 of us. They, they were getting this individualized training. Yeah. And it was just like that for a week. But it's just like anything else. You keep your head down. You don't, The one thing you don't do is you don't complain. Mm-hmm. You don't be like, oh, this is, it's, you pay your dues, mm-hmm. right? And none of it was like weird or like um, inappropriate in a way that like, was disrespectful like to me as a person or derogatory it was just like it was just dumb shit right hey police call that you know mm-hmm. and for anyone who doesn't know or most people should know listen to this police call means picking up trash mm-hmm. anywhere you get online pick up trash so you police call like the area where we go for formation but while you're doing it all of the seniors are dumping cigarettes and trash behind you as you mm-hmm. clean and stuff stuff inside your cargo pockets and they're like and then you t- they go, turn around, and they go, what the fuck? You missed all of this. And then you're like, ah, oh, this will never end, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So when you're living, so you, you move into barracks. Yeah, I lived there for like a month. What percentage of your company lived in the barracks? Almost everyone. Almost everyone Damn. who wasn't married, yeah. And so, so like you're I, talking like there's 100 guys in there. 200, roughly, yeah. 200 animals. 200 guys. Two, not guys, 200 animals. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. Three to a room. Not yeah. not like regular barracks. So there's a bunk bed. There's a bunk bed. There's So the boot's on the bottom. Mm-hmm. There's the top rack. That's like the next senior person. And then there was an individualized rack. That's the most senior person. Mm-hmm. Two Marines in a room. Three. One of them a senior. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> saying, dude, so when you get dude. three, like it's definitely going down. Dude, my, my <laughs> friends would have, tell stuff about like their senior guy just like throwing trash in their bunk, uh, mm-hmm. being like, pick it up, boot, pick it up, boot, pick it up, boot. And you're just like, Ugh. yeah, that's that's in a crazy environment. It's, I'm, but I miss it so much. Of yeah, course. yeah. yeah. It, but it's, you know, and it's, it, it, by that time, I had actually proposed <laughs> to my wife, and so like they were waiting for all my stuff to switch over, um, and we had um, we had actually decided to get married, and we were going to have a wedding in November, mm-hmm. and um, so I was like, she was like, it can't be that bad in the barracks, and I showed her once, and like that was enough for her to be like, never mind. <laughs> 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 you know, she would just always she, it was it was like um, I was making her look at the sun. She was just like yeah. shocked every time she saw it. <laughs> You know, she's like, people talk to you like that. And I was like, please don't say anything. Just get in the car. We got to go. We got to go. Yeah. So at what point do you start? So those guys are coming in, by the way, they were outstanding. They came into Ramadi, uh, did a turn, did a turnover with three, eight and one six was just outstanding. I remember their, their, uh, commanding officer. I remember meeting him just yeah. freaking squared away and you could tell just pro, a pro. So yeah, outstanding guys. And then of course they, you know, did, did a bunch of, uh, good fighting in Ramadi. So when they come back, when do you start like a workup? When do you start training for deployment? Immediately. Immediately. Yeah. And so um, I was very, very blessed. I had a really good team leader. Brandon Kelly took very good care of me. He invested in me. He actually saved his squad leader's life and got an award for it in Ramadi. Um, Was a saw gunner. Um, Long story short, got hurt. He pulled him out. Like he was just this guy and like, very thoughtful, very kind to me. I treated him with respect, and he like showed me honestly like good leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, took care of me, invested in me, and all these things. And uh, from the very beginning, he started teaching me like every bit of the trait. And then I realized I didn't learn anything in SOI, mm-hmm. right? Because everything in SOI in the schoolhouses they're very doctrinal. It's mm-hmm. like on paper and it's flat. Mm-hmm. But these guys, they had just left Ramadi. Mm -hmm. And like that was when I actually started to learn that 1 6 had this incredible legacy of being in historic battles going as far back as Bella Wood and all these different things where you see the French Fortage. And like they've been known for like just terraforming the earth to the will of the Marine Corps. (laughs) And I was like, holy shit, I'm in an incredible place. Like I'm, I'm on the shoulders of giants right now. And it was never lost on me. Never lost on me because I, you know, I was a boot, so it was my job to clean the battalion office and stuff. There's a company, company uh, battalion uh, master guns. He never wore a skivvy shirt, and he loved making fun of lieutenants. That was his whole thing. And um, he'd always be like, he, he's like, look at some of these things on the wall. Look at this as you're cleaning. This is your legacy. Don't don't fucking embarrass them. That's what he would say as we're cleaning. And so he'd be like, stop, and he'd make us read it, and he would just spend time with us. And I was like, wow, this is actually. This is actually like a historic place. I need to like, this wasn't just like a luck of the draw. Guy. There's a reason, mm-hmm. you know, and I need to be respectful of that. Uh, people often ask me about culture and size teams and businesses and organizations, but that's one of the things that I explain is that you've got to share your history. Yeah. 
so that people understand where where they came from. And the Marine Corps does a great, but a lot of the military does a great job with it. The SEAL teams just started doing a good job. They built new SEAL teams, and now the SEAL teams have, you can see the heritage on the walls. You can see the pictures from Vietnam, even going back to World War II. Yeah. And you understand that there's a heritage and a tradition. And so, but the Marine Corps just has been doing that for so long that they know how to do it really well. And like what you're explaining right now, is what I try and explain to people. That's what you're, when you're in a leadership position, that's your job, is to make sure that the the people that come on board the team understand the tradition and the history and the roots of where they came from and where this organization came from. Mm-hmm. And it, it just lifts them up. Yeah. And it makes a person want to excel. Like even when I got to SEAL Team 1, they had the Medal of Honor guys on the quarterdeck. And you're like, okay, that, that's the only thing they had on there. Just the Medal of Honor guys, that's yeah. it. That's like that's what we're doing. And so and that was in the nineties, you know, it was just a little tiny quarter deck, but you're like, Okay, I get it. That's what we're doing. Um, so it's very important and the Marine Corps does a great job of that. So you start this workup and you're doing exercises. Yeah. How's it roll? I mean at, at that time we were tasked with the twenty fourth MU, right? Um and uh, the battalion commander uh, is now Brigadier General Anthony Henderson, one of the most incredible men I've, I've ever known. And, um, you know, a lot was happening in my personal life at that time. Uh, like I said, we'd gotten married and we were planning our, um, our, our wedding, but we had found out that my, my wife had gotten pregnant with our first child. Um, and so, like, that instantly became everyone's knowledge, mm-hmm. even him. How old are you at this point? Uh, 19. Yeah. 19, 20. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. All these things, it, it just, like, life was just moving so quickly. Mm-hmm. Just moving so radically quickly. And, um, you know, I'd actually had to sit down with him a few times to talk about this stuff. And he, like, talked to me and, like, all this stuff. And he's like, well, it's okay. We're going on the 24th Mew. He's like, I'll make sure you make every appointment you can and, like, all this stuff. And was very kind to me. And within reason, I, I went as much as I could, but like it was the 24th Mew and, you know, it's basically a base, a mobile base, as, as you know. And um, like you have all these direct assets and you're just doing like real radical training mm-hmm. to prepare for any type of global conflict wherever you're going. And at this at this time, they're like, you guys are going to the Mediterranean. Now, I'm a boot <laughs> in, in a unit with a bunch of guys from Ramadi. They couldn't be happier. They could not be happy. I could not be <laughs> med crew. Yes. Oh yeah. I could not be more unhappy because yeah. what they're saying to me is like you're going to be a boot forever, mm-hmm. basically. Because if all that counted at that time was you have to deploy, you have to deploy to a combat zone. The war is still actively going on. I mean, Iraq's kind of. I want to say it's scaling down, but it was like it's leveling. Two thousand eight. I mean, it's two thousand eight with Solder City. There's all kinds of stuff still going on. Yeah, but it was it was it wasn't as there wasn't as much focus at at, at, that, at that time yeah. in the sense of like. There was a, at least a plan in place from my perspective, and like it, it seemed like uh, they understood the routine of it, is what I'll say. Mm-hmm. And so um, I was like, "Why not go to Iraq?" You know, and they're like, "No, there's like green zones, and there was like too many Marines and not enough missions, or whatever." That's what they told us. So I was like, "Okay." And so we're doing really crazy training. You know, at the time it was called Fort Pickett. I think they re- they changed the name of it now. So like we go there and do like these big thirty day exercises. We're going to the field once a week. Um, you know, Monday through Thursday, you know, going to defensive, all these different things. Like you're doing training all the time Mm -hmm. and it sucks, but I loved it. Mm -hmm. I absolutely loved it because you're hanging out with like what will become your best friends and you don't know it at the time, but like you're basically being paid by the government to hang out with your friends. That's that's the military right there. It's so, (laughs) it's so, it's so awesome. Especially when you're in a combat job, because like when you're not training or deployed, you know, you know, don't be seen and don't be heard. Just go away. Like, like they always say, no one can hide like an infantry unit in, in the garrison. Like doors are shut, blinds are shut. Like don't, don't look, don't ask the questions. We tell you no lies. And, uh, you know, all this is happening and you know, it just feels good. And like all this stuff. So we're coming up on this whole workup. And so by the time, you know, we're getting closer to, um, so were you supposed to deploy on a ship to the med? We were supposed to deploy on a ship, and I was even on a ship for 30 days, and it was the worst 30 days of, of I of I ever. did two uh, amphibious ready group deployments when I was a young SEAL, and both of them obviously with the Marine Corps, but I did two. That meant I did two workups yeah. with the Marine Corps. Yeah. With, so we did, like, freaking beach landings and we did assault. That. Yeah, we yeah. did everything that you could do. The elbows. So, and, and, and we lived with them. I mean, we lived with the Marines. And You did? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, on a ship, of course. 
Yeah, two, <laughs> two deployments like yeah. that. And and that's why, you know, that's one of the reasons why I was very, very lucky because if you didn't have that experience in the SEAL teams, mm-hmm. you wouldn't understand how conventional units work. You, mm-hmm. you wouldn't even know what a company was, what a battalion was. You just wouldn't know because you're not in it. You're mm-hmm. not doing it. You're in some random, like my first deployment was what we used to call spec ops deployment where you went to, we went to, uh, Guam and then mm-hmm. we did exercise from there, but you're just with a bunch of seals yeah. And so you're just doing seal stuff and you're not interacting with anybody else So being forced to interact with the Marine Corps and I was a radio man So like I had to figure out all the comms and and it just taught me so much and I was so lucky and I got to understand The, the quality of the Marine Corps yeah. and how they functioned and you know some of the things that we needed to adapt to and be like Oh, yeah, the Marine Corps is not gonna be doing that like that's not the way they're gonna work So I no. was very lucky that I got to be able to do that no, I mean, like the one month we were on a ship, I, I realized one, if you don't have a job on a ship, everyone hates you. <laughs> they all have real jobs. And um, I I was a boot, so I was in the bottom of the coffin rack. Mm. And so for perspective, I had a book that I was reading. I can't remember what it was. I want to say it was like, you know, Gates of Fire or something, mm-hmm. some required reading I was told to do. But I remember I had to lean the book flat to turn the page mm-hmm. to pull it back up just to read. And I was like... All right, <laughs> like, this is it. Yeah, you know, ran out of water. It, all these things happening. Plumbing backs up, and I was just like, okay. And everyone's like, gangway or sick bay, gangway or sick bay, and we're just, you know, we're just dum dums there eating chow and mm-hmm. being like, this is pretty great. You know, we're being grunts. But we did that for thirty days. We literally left and invaded Onslow Beach. That's what we did. We got <laughs> off, and you know, a buddy of mine um, got washed away. Almost lost his uh, a barrel on his saw. Damn. Yeah, it was pretty rough, but um. Yeah, the whole time they're like, you're going to the Mediterranean. We had to do like these emergency drills where we had to do like a, you know, a stand to or like be ready to respond to whatever. And it all seemed great until they were like, actually, you're not going to the Mediterranean. When did you find that out? February of 2008. And when was deployment? Uh, February of 2000, late February 2008. So you found out. Actually, yeah, late February, yeah. Basically, March. like the time when it was time to start getting ready to leave, that's when you found out. Yes, <laughs> and that was around the the day uh, the due date of my uh, first child, uh, my daughter. Oh. So we were on we were on post uh, a pre deployment leave, and so we we were in Nashville. My wife. And so I. now you know that you're going mm-hmm. to Afghanistan. They had told us like two weeks okay. prior to that, and then you go on leave. We go on leave. How when did your wife do? Like in a couple of weeks, she was. She had, it was very close. Mm-hmm. It was very close, and so we'd gone to the doctor, and he's like, "Well, you know, it could be any day now." And I was like, "Uh, <laughs> we don't, we don't have any day." And so I, you know, you know, by God's grace, miracle, stress, or whatever, we we went home, and you know, um, she was taking a bath, and and then she's like, "There's something happening. There's <laughs> something happening," and uh, we all got in the car, drove down to the hospital, and. That not long after that, I'd become a father. Mm. And uh, I was supposed to be back. I was supposed to be back home. And I had to call my platoon sergeant. And I was like, hey, you know, I, I can't come home. I'm not coming home. And I was just like, they're going to like throw me in the brig. Wait, home being I can't come back, back to, to base. I can't go back to base. I can't. Right. I can't come back. You know, I'm, I'm staying here for this. Whatever. You want to put me. You want to bury me under the brig. I don't care. Like I, I was there. And, um, <laughs> you know, I you know, as you know, when you become a father, like uh, women become father, I mean, women become uh, mothers over nine months. I say fathers, I mean, men become fathers in nine seconds. <laughs> like right after the baby's born, you're like, I need insurance. I need like savings. I need a good car. We need these, like as soon as I held her, like all my life made sense to me. <laughs> and I was like, I need to do whatever I can to be with her as much as I can. And um, my platoon sergeant at the time was uh, um, he was known for his enthusiasm. He had a real hands-on approach to leadership, <laughs> if um, if you can believe that. Uh, a little too hands-on when he was on the drill field, but um, he uh, he was very like, "That's okay, it's fine." And he's like, "You'll leave with Charlie Company," and I was like, "Oh, well, that's that's cool." And so I was there with my daughter for two days, um, and then went went back and. And I left a different company mm-hmm. and went straight to Afghanistan. That was my first kid too. My first kid was born, and I left the next day for a six month deployment. It, it was it was it was brutal. It was I was I mean like I it was the first moment where I was like ah, this life is hard. I, I'm not I'm not sure about this, mm-hmm. you know, because as I held her, you know, and you know she's getting ready to start driving on her own now, and like I think about her and 
you know, how much I love her and her mother and everything. It was just like, ah, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I, it was the first time I felt uh, fallible, if that makes sense. It's like, but until then I was full of like, you know, I came in at like less than 120 pounds. I'm, you know, I'm big and I'm bad. I'm a boot. I'm doing all these things. But mm-hmm. then that happens and I'm like, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm a human. And, uh, so yeah, it, it's, it was, it was tough time. And, um, you know, uh, went straight, went to trolley company, flew with them. It was kind of weird because like no one knew what to do with me. Um, there had been some guys who'd gotten in trouble pre-deployment, a bunch of them, um, like 30 of them across the battalion. They had, um, were they piss hot or something? Yes. I was, I was going to allude to it, but, uh, yeah, that's exactly what had happened. And 30 uh, dudes. Yeah. Do you think some of that was inspired by, uh, not wanting to go on this deployment? I don't know exactly. I don't want to say that. Maybe, um, but because that's a lot of guys. I also don't think you should drug test pre-deployment. Personally, like we weren't in a we weren't in a situation to. Okay. That's one way of looking at it. <laughs> I mean, like it's a, pr- a very practical way of looking at it. Here's it's a, a very practical way of looking. Here's at the thing: it. you were you were in charge and the leader, and the TNO was was tight to begin with. There, we weren't. Mm-hmm. We didn't have a bench. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't have a backup roster. So like in the grand scheme of things, if guys are going to do something and I'm not advocating anything, I just, I, I, I don't know. It just, that is an interesting move to, to piss test everyone we were, right before going on a plane. We didn't have full platoons. Yeah. Like if you lost 30 guys. Yes. Damn. Yes. I mean, your battalion's what, 550 people or something like uh, that? Let's, let's say 30 to a platoon, uh, four platoons to a company, you know, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, mm-hmm. you know, H&S. Uh, so mm-hmm. like. You know, it's not that many people yeah. to begin with. I mean, and this is like 7% of personnel or something like that. It was stab in the dark, but it's it's a significant portion of people. I'd never heard of a unit doing it before, to be honest. What did they piss hot for? Like pot? No. No. The, uh, the other substances. Like Coke? Yeah, a lot of okay. them. A lot of them. Like it was snowing. Damn. In Camp Lejeune at that time. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> it was. Yeah. It was Did, it was rough. Was there I mean was there some kind of a crackdown going on? I so Because I, occasionally like in the SEAL teams, someone like there'd be some drug bust and they would test everybody. So yeah, I think there was enough incidents to where they like I think everyone was doing it at that time, but like in general, I had never I'll put it this way, they didn't do it the next deployment. I'd never heard of them doing that before deployment either. And mm-hmm. again, I'm not advocating anything whatsoever. It's just an unusual move. I mean, these guys are getting ready to go to war. Like, like mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but it was a big deal, and I was treated like one of them. And I had to tell people, I was like, I, I had a kid. I didn't do drugs. I had a kid. Because everyone was like, they were like, come here, you fucking. They were like, there was a bunch of them, and I was with them because they ended up becoming the remain behind element, right? Oh, um, man. And so I was, I was like, no, I'm, I'm Bell. I just had a child. <laughs> like I just kept, oh, you're fine. Come here. And like they would literally put them on working parties. Some of them they processed out. Others, and this is an important thing that I want people to know. What had happened was they, they had. They knew some people had failed had failed the drug test, and a bunch of these names. There were a few of them. They came to them. And they go, Jocko, we know you did this. Blah 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 blah. Just tell us the truth. Just tell us the truth, and we'll we'll make this as minimal as possible. The like three guys who told the truth deployed. Hmm. They. I don't. I don't That's know. That's not where I thought that story was going. They actually were not. Um, not admonished. They were seen as making mistakes. All these things mm-hmm. had happened, and they were actually, you know, they finished out their time in the Marine Corps. Good for them. And, you know, it's always taught me to tell the truth, no matter what. It was the ones who lied, the ones who tried to cover up, the ones who did those other things. They were done. Adcept done later. I'm sure they tell different stories now, but that's mm-hmm. not what happened. Yeah, that's the zero tolerance that the military has for drugs. Yes, for sure. And I again, like it was just, it was just this weird. There were so many like weird moments in my career, but like that manifested into where like I was. We got to Afghanistan, so we're in Kandahar Airfield. We're like doing drills. We got like a few weeks to acclimatize, and they look at me and my friend, and they go, "You two in third platoon, you go to second platoon." They that's how that's how many people we lost, mm-hmm. right? And so I was in this platoon where. I was known for an enthusiastic platoon sergeant. And then I went to this other platoon and my squad leader, his name's Ryan Madden. He comes out to me and he goes, what's your name? And I was like, Sergeant, my name's Lance Corbell. He goes, that's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Ryan. Don't call me that during working hours. Sergeant Madden, we're working. Good to go? I was like, yes, Sergeant. He goes, what'd I just tell you? <laughs> and I was like, okay. And um, I went from being someone who was told to do things to someone that was taught to do things. 
Nice. And my career literally changed overnight. And it was such a it was such a jump and like a change. I can imagine it's it I don't I don't know what it can equate to, but like when I was moving my cot out of the third platoon, like tent area to second platoon, everyone was like fucking bell, dude. You're going to second like it was that big of a deal. Mm-hmm. Can't believe I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. Cause like it was it was like I was getting I was like getting paroled or something. Like it was like you you made it out. Like you made it out. <laughs> And it, everything changed after that. Everything changed. Yeah, that when you people ask me the whole time, you know, well, how do you get someone to step up and lead? It's like treat them as a leader. Yeah, give them the opportunity, let them step up, and then the, the whole idea of building relationships, trust, listen, respect, influence, care. You put some trust in somebody, like, hey, you you get it. Like even that little that little moment where this guy's like, hey, if we're not at work, Ryan's cool. Yeah, if we're, that is actually putting trust in you. As a Lance Corporal, like, hey, you understand that if we're at work, you're gonna we're gonna be professional. Yes. If we're not at work, we can be cool. It's a it's the first little step of, hey man, I, I trust you to be smart enough to you know, not abuse the situation. If we're out of work, I'm not wearing my uniform, cool, I'm Ryan. If we're at work, especially the boss is around, you, you know it's the gig. Yep, yeah. got it. We got it, we good, yep. It's just giving you a little bit of trust. And then you trust him even more. Right there, out of the gate, he's giving you respect. You're respecting him more. That's just how this stuff is supposed to work. It it is, and it was it was jarring. I mean, it was it was it was unlike him. Him and my team leader, Mike Canner, like, um, you know, Ryan had come from two five. Another, he was a West Coast guy. Had done all the initial Iraq stuff, and he was like, I always said he was like real California. He's like from the Northwest, and he's like, what's up, dude? And like, yeah, um, but like. It was one of the first times some a sergeant of all people had treated me like a, a normal person. Because mm-hmm. sergeant in the infantry is a big fucking Hell deal. Yeah. It's hard to get there, and, like, he's a squad <laughs> leader, you know, and, like, he's he's investing in me. He's teaching me stuff. I'm doing stuff, mm-hmm. and, like, I'm being treated like a person, and it was it was awesome. Yeah, good lessons learned there for people. So then what's your, what's your job now? What's your mission, I should say? So um, the, the mission of the unit was to insert into a town called Garmser, um, Afghanistan. No one had been there since like 2003, I believe it was, or Afghanistan at that time. And Kandahar Airfield with like the big boardwalk and mm-hmm. all that stuff was, you know, scaling up and all these things were happening. And they had that really nice part of the base and the Marines were over in what became the septic tank area, um, okay. <laughs> like literally. And um, we were just there for three weeks, three, about three weeks running drills, getting used to the elevation and stuff and just preparing to go out there and assault the town. It was in the clear hold build era mm-hmm. of the war on terror. Yep. Like we'd insert into a place, hold it, and then build it up and just run operations there. Yep. How did you guys insert? Hilo. How many did you t- was this a company? Was this a battalion, battalion size operation? Size, battalion size element. Oh damn. Yeah. The largest no not that one. They would that was not what they said. That was in Marsha. But like they were like, Yeah, no one had done it, no one had been there. And so, like, we, it was literally like landing on Tatooine, is how I remember it. <laughs> like, because there was nothing. Echo can relate. Yeah. Echo <laughs> appreciates your Understand. reference. Yeah, yeah. Now the force is strong with this one. I get <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Over here, this guy. <laughs> yeah. Combat no. experience, not so much. No. Star Wars mm-hmm. in yes, the sir. game. Yes. No, no. I was just rewatching Episode One the other day. It's an underrated movie. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Agree. That's yeah. Okay. Underrated. So yes. Episode One is. Not the first one that came out in 1975, right? It's like it came out later. But no. Okay. Yeah. Do people watch them in order now, like the proper order that they're supposed to be in? I mean, I do. Um, but like that also like came out around like, you know, the time when I was in middle school like those. But like, you know, it's the story of Anakin Skywalker and, you know, the path that he walks and how it changes everything. Mm-hmm. The thing that he loves the most is the thing that hurts him. There's a lot of allusions to it. It's all like Joseph Campbell stuff too. That's where all Star Wars comes from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The hero's journey. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, the hero's journey. The wizard is Obi Wan Kenobi. Like it's all. It's all there, dude. It's all there. Um, Interesting. But no, it was literally like Tatooine. So that's was, what you're going into. Yeah, it was. It was crazy. It was. It was. It was unlike anything I'd ever experienced because, like, in Kandahar Airfield, there's a Tim Hortons and a mm. Burger King. <laughs> And that's some people's deployment. Mm-hmm. Toby Keith even came to see us, mm-hmm. you know. Um, he did. And there was a there was an air raid attack that came in 
um, while he was singing the Taliban song. And so his like attache like ran out underneath him was like, no, no, like put him undercover. And we all started booing because we're animals mm. like bring him back, bring him back. <laughs> and he came back out on stage and finished the Taliban song <laughs> while the Taliban were attacking the base. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome, man. So um, like that was there. Jump cut. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Uh-huh. Right. And how uh, clued you're going in who's briefing you did you have a battalion size brief yeah yeah we did you know we had the stuff's pushed down mm. like i remember we had a terrain model it was my job as a boot to guard it certain mm. hours of the day i had to like was it the full battalion terrain model for yeah. everyone yeah okay. yeah it was a it was huge it was a big sandbox mm-hmm. in the middle of a tent um you know and like i would look at it and be like i have no idea <laughs> like it just you know unless you're there like a map is just a map you know what i'm saying and um you know, but but again, my squad leader at the time, he would start asking me questions about the stuff I was looking at. Not just like, what's that? He's like, tell me what that means. What does that do? What would you do to move through this type of battle space? What, you know, what type of blah, blah, blah. Like literally everything that like was shaping me as a person, as a leader, as an infantryman, he was putting into me. It was a real like uh, wax on, wax off method. So you go to the big battalion brief, like the whole battalions there or all the guys that are all it, the all the... That was like company Infantry level. Infantry companies, okay. Yeah, like the squad leaders, the platoon commanders, they went to those things, but mm-hmm. then it, like we got then company. Then it come down to you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, cause just too many people yeah, and not yeah, enough for spaces. Sure. And you remember, so the company size brief, that's when you're getting kind of the word. Yeah, they're passing word down, here's what we're gonna do, here are how things are gonna happen. I mean, you know, it, it doesn't really, uh, I don't wanna say it doesn't matter, it's just, you don't really understand what you're listening to in the moment. Mm-hmm. And like, my whole job is just to hold security. My whole job is to hold, like, that's what I'm doing. That's like, what you're focused on. Well, well, yeah, because at the, you know, when orders are given in the military, it's very, very simple. I always break it down to like, you know, there's a desired end state, the commander's intent, and then the method to which you choose to execute that, right? And that's basically it. The desired intent was to win the war. The commander's intent was how they told us to do it. And then what we did was how we got there, mm-hmm. right? And so um, that was basically it. My job was to hold security and do make sure my team was taken care of. You know, I was an A gunner. I wasn't a point man. It was just my job to like be with the first team, make sure everything was good. How built up was this area? Like, what was it? Was it mud huts? Mud, mud huts mainly. Mm-hmm. Um, and no one had been there for since the Russians, um, which was weird. Like we would hit open areas and there was like a battalion of tanks that had been left in place. Mm. Cause when they left, they literally like left. Gee, that sounds familiar. Yes, it does. Um, <clears throat> That's why, you know, it's a place, what is it? Uh, the, the Graveyard the, of Empires. The Graveyard Empires, which is weird because, like, you would see it and, like, some of the, you would see that, but, like, they don't have, like, plasma torches out there, but every now and then you'd see, like, a door with, like, a weird, like, sickle and hammer over it mm-hmm. or, like, a piece of metal on a house. Like, oh, they just, like, cut that out with a torch or something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so, like, we landed and then we just started conducting operations, like, immediately. And we were so far out there that there was no logistical support so like we would just take over a compound, you know, knock holes in the wall, you know, set up post and then just start running and gunning. So would you, were you in a company location in an yes. FOB? Uh, so um, not yet, but we initially in the clear phase, we were just like platoon size platoon elements, size elements, which is perfect. Mm-hmm. It is absolutely perfect. And did you methodically move from mm-hmm. like one side to the other of, yeah. the, of the terrain? So we initially landed like the center of the town and just pushed out to like the outskirts mm-hmm. into like basically where there was nothing. Like literally to, there was like roaming herds of camels and stuff like that. <laughs> and like it was just flat. And I remember being like, whoa, there's nothing here. And then we would, that was when we got like the order where they reconstructed um, the area of operations and moved each unit to where they were going to be the company you know, Alpha Company here, Bravo, Charlie, and so forth and so on. How was the clearance? Um, what it was were you a, running into? It was okay. It wasn't really that bad, to be honest. Um, it was dynamic, but it, we were attached to a MU, so we have direct support from air artillery and everything. So, mm-hmm. like, immediately, 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 immediately. Like, I once saw a little bird just, just like, do a gun, just to come down, do a gun run on, like, two, two or three guys. <laughs> like, it was not overkill. It was just direct, immediate asset support. Mm-hmm. Um you know, and it took some time and we were like running underneath artillery rounds. They would like call in, you know, danger close, which I found out what that was. And then we would go through and clear after, you know, <laughs> like. And you, so this was freaking kinetic. Then. It was very kinetic. It was very kinetic. But like the difference um, in my first point and second deployment is like in Garmser, 
uh, we we had superiority in the battle space the entire time, the entire time. Like we were always we were always pushing the enemy as opposed mm-hmm. to them pushing against us. And no one had been there in so long. They were looking back on it. They're probably just waiting to see what we would do because mm-hmm. we were developing you know SOPs on on the fly as it was happening. You know, going through and you know we come across like different little you know caches of like you know ID materials or weapons and different things like that. And so we would just set up these um, platoon size elements and we would use those platoon um, patrol bases until we eventually consolidated into two company bases. One was called Apache North and one was called Apache South. And so two platoons there, like three actually. How bad were the IEDs? There's just not that many there. Yeah. There's it, just not that many there. Because the transition really hadn't taken place yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was coming. Yeah. But the they learned a lot. The, the Afghan Taliban yeah. learned a lot from what happened in Iraq. And the Iraqis learned from freaking Hamas yes. and the Iranians how to how to do that yeah. and how what an effective we- weapon uh, an IED was whether it was a roadside bomb whether it was anti-personnel but this was during the escalation phase mm-hmm. where yeah like for you guys to how was the casualties um we, we took some we we lost some guys one of the uh the sniper teams one of the guys who was attached to us for a long time we lo- we lost him um you know, there was the the main threat was the enemy just ambushing you or, or setting up some type of positions for you. Um, there's a very famous photo that was taken of um, a marine. The marine's getting shot and he's ducking down. You, you've probably seen mm-hmm. it. The rounds coming over. He just has a skivvy shirt on his rifle. He was um, mm-hmm. Bill B is his name, and that was actually the place where that happened. So the enemy was shooting at us from this field for a long time. And, um, you know, myself and my squad leader were actually behind a wall when an RPG hit it and it blew us back and messed me up pretty bad and him too. But we didn't know at the time how indestructible the, the walls were. Mm-hmm. And, you know, thankfully it was, but, you know, he didn't know that at the time. And he actually shielded me with his body um, and something I've never forgotten. And um, but this area had been giving us trouble for a while and we knew they were trying to bait us to cross this this open space. Right. And uh, we ended up crossing it, and there was just these uh, machine gun uh, positions set up that you couldn't see until you were on top of them, and they had set them up just for that. Mm -hmm. And that was the type of stuff that would happen, and, you know, we lost a Marine that way. Yeah. Others through, like, IEDs and stuff. But, like, there's there's not a lot of roads. We were doing Mm -hmm. air supply, you know, airdrop resupply. Like, there's one road, and, like, we just – we weren't near it. I can't stress how far and away we were from everything. It was Mm -hmm. was weird. (laughs) Um, how long did it take you to get the initial clearance done? Maybe a month is what it felt like a month or so. I mean, you know, from the time that I left home, I didn't call home for like 90 days and that was on a sat phone, you know, and, uh, you know, we weren't Navy SEALs, so we all didn't have one. So it was, it was, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was one for per platoon and, um, not one, one for the company actually. And, uh, that, that was when we had established our patrol bases by that point, just the platoon size ones. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, but that was like halfway through the deployment basically. So halfway through you, you had, you had established your platoon size yeah. patrol bases. Yeah. And then they consolidated the battle space into a company size patrol base. Well, two company patrol bases because the AO shifted again. So what, what had happened, what was happening was that one six was transitioning the battle space over to a British unit that mm-hmm. was going to backfill us but they were half the size we were. They were like out of New Delhi, I believe mm-hmm. it was. So they needed to, so you guys needed to be a little bit more aggressive and, and you know, when I read about the history of this, they talked about there was a lot of activity down south yes. in the south area, so you needed to kind of push down south? Yes, that's where we were, we were Apache South, yeah. It was, it was dynamic, <laughs> it was dynamic. I don't know what else to say, like it was, but it, it didn't feel as dangerous as it as maybe I should have thought it was. Mm-hmm. But like again, we had like something happen, you know, air, artillery, you know, instantly. Close air support. And how was the civilian populace you were interacting with? There was they were pretty cool for the most part. Like, I mean, they just don't care. I mean, mm-hmm. I can't stress how little that they're unfazed by war. When we pushed out one time we went out like we do like like once a month or so we do like a long range like sweeping patrol mm-hmm. to really just kind of break up the AO and to stir up whatever was moving mm-hmm. 
And um, we saw this guy. He couldn't have had more than four fingers on both of his hands. And he looked at us and he goes, I'm not scared of you, white boy. I was killing Russians before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, good to go, sir. Good to go. <laughs> yeah, Good to go. Yeah, you you win. And he's like, get, get out of here. <laughs> like, he's like, get out of here. He said white boy? That's what he said. That's Dang. what it translated to. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, he'd been making bombs, you know, since you know Jesus left Jerusalem. He wasn't scared of anybody, <laughs> so um, and he came out to meet us. Like he was really, he was like bowed up at us, mm-hmm. and just literally both of his hands missing fingers. A mm-hmm. little too much, you know, ammonia and nitrate here and there, I guess. So, <laughs> but like the rest of them were pretty cool. The jingle trucks were fine as long as we didn't slow them down. I mean, I just. I always think about like how weird it was to see us. Like that was something I think about. Like you're just like living your life normally, and then you okay. see like a bunch of dudes patrolling. Like that's weird. See them? They took over Tom's house. They just like kicked him out and paid him a <laughs> paid him a ton of money, and yeah. now they live there. Yeah. And, but um, you know, we we did that. You know, and um, uh, I I mean I don't I went to a wedding. I've never told this story publicly. Yeah. Um. So. Like an Afghan wedding. Yes, sir. Okay. It was a night patrol. <laughs> um, so it was a night patrol, and uh, we had been begun rotating out different stuff. And again, thanks to Ryan and, and Mike, I, I was moved in different positions. And Ryan actually started training us like we were team leaders and squad leaders. He would, on the job training, mm-hmm. start being awesome. like, like, this is what you need to do. What do we do, Zach? And like, to a point to where, like, at one point, he's like, I'm not going to make the decision. You have to make it. And um, again, he I owe so much to him, and I'll, I'll never be able to repay that but and what was his his position in your platoon he was my squad leader so okay. he was in charge of three fire teams and he reported up to the platoon got commander. it and he let you like kind of role play yeah i mean he wasn't it was like literally i won't say he was holding my hand but yeah. he's like zach what are we doing what yeah. checkpoint are he we wouldn't at? let you make a tr- freaking catastrophic call or anything for sure but, but he's like let you make decisions every make decision decisions. Yeah, like awesome. it was it was scary it was scary i'm not gonna lie it was absolutely scary um but after you do it a few times you're like okay you know, I, I I can do this, but one of the, it was my turn to be a point man is what it came down to. And, um, we had gotten chatter that they were moving materials to this village. Let's go out and see what's happening. Go to the village, looking around, you know, MVGs, we had 14s. They're weird too. You can't really tell what's happening. You either choose near or far distance. And I remember I could see like some flames and I could see a lot of, a lot of bodies. And he, he's like, I'm like, we're holding up. And everyone can see it too. You're just like, you can hear little whispers and stuff. Excuse me. And uh, he's like, what's going on? And I was like, I don't know. And I was like, what are we going to do? And he's like, well, we're going to find out. And then he grabs my shoulder, right? Because we'd always, I don't like people do the tap or stuff. Like we always did grab, grab, go, right? Mm-hmm. Release. And we stack on the door. And then we could hear him. We're getting closer. We get up on the door, stack on it, grab, grab, go. Boom. Kick open the door. I roll left. He rolls right. And then we look around, and right as I do, I just see, like, 14 people sitting down at a rug. And the, I see steam from food and rice and all this stuff. And I go, oh, my <laughs> God. And then he goes to the right, and, we're like, we're all in there looking around. Very quickly, we, you know, we establish security, make sure everything's good and safe. And we look around, and, you know, through some loose translation, we find out that they're having a wedding. Did you have a terp with you? Yes. Did you have Afghan forces with you, police or anything this like that? This is prior to that. This is prior to that. Okay. Prior to that. Um, <clears throat> and they're like, it's a wedding, it's a wedding. And so, like, we're sitting around, and they're like, hey. You, and the, the father starts laying out a, a mat for us, and then puts a big old pile of meat, and then puts a big old pile of rice. And it had been a while since I'd eaten something <laughs> that wasn't government made. And so we're all... We're all sitting there, and I look at I look at him, and they show us how to eat it. He goes, he goes like he like looks at him, and he goes, "You grab you grab the meat, and you grab the rice, and boom, or that's how you do it. Boom, mm-hmm. like you you make a hand spoon is basically what it was." <laughs> and uh, I like look around, and Ryan goes, "You only live once," and he grabs the meat and he grabs the rice, and we all do it right, and it was delicious. I don't know what meat it was. I know the rice was rice. I don't know what mm-hmm. meat what the protein was, and. Um, you know, we just crashed the wedding. We left. Thank you so much. Good. Well, <laughs> jump cut. We have to go straight from post, uh, straight from patrol to post. And Ryan's walking around checking on us as he's supposed to do as a squad leader. And he's like, "Hey, how you doing?" And I'm like, <laughs> "How's your gut? <laughs> How's your stomach feeling?" And I go, "Not good." And then see, uh, yeah, SOG, SOG, this is post one. Like all of us got sick. We all vomited. We all had to get a shot. 
and uh, we all went down for 24 hours after that. Like the the squad was unmovable. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I never ate anything, bro. Yeah. I never ate anything. You wouldn't have eaten if you'd gone no, to a wedding? No, 100%. Zero. Know. Zero chance. I mean, zero chance. You only live once. I, I, no, I'm, I'm telling you, like zero chance. I'm eating any of that. Yeah. Uh, food, zero <laughs> percent. I barely will go to a like a restaurant that I don't know. I only go to yeah. three restaurants. What you are know they? What I mean? <laughs> well, here in San Diego, it's like there's a place called Raglan, which okay, I, which I go to a lot. There was a place called Fiddler's Green, which shut down, so that one's kind of off the books now. Island Prime, you know where Enrique works? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, he works there. Jiu-jitsu guy. Um, Fiddler's Green was the name of a patrol base we yeah, went to in yeah. Afghanistan. Well, there's a whole story behind Fiddler's Green. Yeah, yeah. And then eh, there's probably one other restaurant that I go to. Well, all malt, malt shop across the street. Yeah, so the, there you go, classic malt shop. But me walking into a random Afghan wedding and Come thinking on. I'm going to eat their food, it ain't happening. Well, you know, I was there for hearts and minds. Yeah. So we were trying to win was, the population over. Yep. Yeah. I, I would purposely... You know, I would have got my assistant platoon commander be like, hey, get up here on this rice and meet, whatever yeah. it is. Get in there and make friends, bro. Yeah. That's on you. <laughs> That's the perks of leadership right there. But no, we, we I mean, like after that, the kind of the, the deployment kind of came to like a, you know, a, a wrap. There wasn't, wasn't really much left to it. I mean, we were just handed over the battle space to the Brits. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And even, even as they report that, like, you know, you guys, you guys actually transitioned with the Brits to like civil operations. Now you're doing civil affairs. Yeah. Now you're helping them. Bit rebuild. And we did that the whole that time. Yeah. The whole time we were doing battle damage assessment, repaying them, and boy, they were they were throwing out numbers. You'd show up and be like, "What about this wall?" And you're like, "What wall?" And they would like knock a hole in it, mm-hmm. and they're like, "That one." You're like, "You're just counting them off." Mm-hmm. Sure, whatever. You know, we're already here. You know, <laughs> giving them some of that mo- monopoly money. <laughs> yes, it. That's they loved it. They were like, "Yeah, dude, you killed like twelve goats," and you're like, "But I thought you were a cow farmer." <laughs> I was until you killed all my goats, you know, <laughs> you know, so like, it's just stuff like that. But, um, you know, the, saw the Brits, I was fascinated by them endlessly. Mm-hmm. Um, they would, they would like roll out in shorts and stuff and mm-hmm. like barely any gear and be like, Oh, come on, mate, you know, queen of country. And I was like, <laughs> all right. And you know, I even, um, you know, we went to that, the base where uh, Prince Harry was, they said he was there uh-huh. It looked like him. I don't. I don't know. We watched Iron Man together. Is what I think happened because uh-huh. the whole base came together to watch a bootleg Iron Man in Afghanistan, which right is on. which is funny because it's about <laughs> Afghanistan. And it was, I haven't seen it. You so. haven't seen Iron Man? No. Sorry, I didn't mean to give it away. It's about a guy who he becomes. Spoiler become, alert! Spoiler alert! I got a spoiler alert! I'm not going to see Iron Man. How do you like them apples? Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, the Brits, you know, my experience work, working with the Brits, which has happened quite a few times over the years, they're just freaking professionals. They're just so professional with yeah. everything. So outstanding. So, and then, so how much time did you, you were, you were in like Kandahar for the first three weeks. Yeah. Boom. In the field. Yep. Whole time. The whole time. Yeah. 200. Come back to how long are you in Kandahar for like a week and then you go home? A week and you go home. Yeah. You go through uh, Kyrgyzstan is where we would transition to is how Air Force Base. And how is your transition to you coming home? Ooh. Um, it was a lot. It's, um, oh, that's right. You got a six month, seven month old baby. Yeah. Seven month old child. Oh, yeah. That was, it was awesome. Yeah. That was, that was like the coolest feeling in the world. Mm-hmm. Honestly, just being there and being to see her and my wife and like, I'll never forget that. The only thing I don't understand is we like arrived in the dead of night, like the Taliban were going to find us, which is weird. Cause we didn't like meet up in a parking lot. We met at the base. So like, I was always like, we could have showed up in like a decent time. What but do you it, mean? Like the when you flew home when we flew home and there's like an arrival like celebration where you come out and you go turn in your weapons to the armory and it was like 10 o'clock at night or something no it's like two o'clock in the morning oh but that's just the way the flight's scheduled i i blame it on marine corps scheduling Jack. because like be. i mean we're we're booking it it's not like you know united had other marine corps flights that day <laughs> um but like it always felt like we had to sneak in to get a, to get under the radar I, I just didn't understand it but you know i, I come back and you know after that, I'm officially not a boot. And on top of that, I'm a husband and a father. And now it's time to do the next workup, mm-hmm. like very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. At that time during the Marine Corps, almost immediately, they take the short timers and they're like, go away. Mm-hmm. They get removed from any leadership role, any responsibility. They put them in like a platoon usually, or they just, they all go to one squad. And then, you know, now it's my turn. And Brian came to me and he goes, I want you to be my first team leader. Jack. And I was like, okay. I can do it. And he's going to stay as squad leader? Yeah, he 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 had come over from um he had been on the drill field. He was a uh, a PMI, mm-hmm. which is like a range coach. Okay. And he uh 
he had uh, left there, and this is where he was. He had actually re-enlisted in Afghanistan. Hell yeah. With an Op 4 contract, which is funny. What's an Op 4 contract? So the contract was basically he had to stay into a Victor unit, a deployable unit, and there was a bonus incentive based off of that. Yeah. Yeah. Love. Yeah. <laughs> it was those George Bush years. That bonus was hefty. <laughs> hefty. Yeah. Well, it's also in the middle of a war. Yes. I don't know what the, bo- the bonuses are creeping back up again right now because they can't get anyone to join or they're having a hard time. Yeah, I, I imagine so. But this was this was a, an annual salary they had. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, whoa. And yeah, it was cool. So how were you when the next round of boots showed up and now you're an old guy with a combat action ribbon? I was very kind. I was very caring. <laughs> no, I mean, I tried to. I tried to always do the things like you know, because it was such a shift. I went from a platoon with like a drill instructor mentality to working with Ryan and them in second platoon. I I just tried to, you know, I tried to say funny things. It's kind of what I do now, still, I guess. And as I look on it, like I'd be like, "Hey, if you still remember the Warriors' breakfast from boot camp, get over here. You know, please call this." I was never like degrading. That was never my thing. Mm-hmm. I don't find that to be useful. I mean, because ultimately you're going to rely on each other in combat. There's no point to that. And I would just try to teach in them, teach them, and invest in them the way people would have done with me. But I was just glad to not have to do, you know. <laughs> Dumb shit. Dumb shit, yeah. <laughs> like, the first time you clean out a laundry room in a barracks and you're like, I don't live here. <laughs> like, you're like, what are these animals doing? Like, there was there would be times where Marines would get, be doing their laundry drunk and just vomit in the washer. Like, that was a very common thing. Yeah, that's just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's just yeah, like, That's just outstanding. It's just a bunch of dudes, man. I mean, like, what do you, it's just yeah. a bunch of dudes being bros. That's, yeah. that's what it's like in an infantry barracks. Yeah. Like, all right, I'm going to tell this story. Like, one guy... One guy, I was working duty, right? You, does it, I imagine everyone knows what duty is, but in case they don't, in a barracks, there is a, an NCO, a non-commissioned officer, and um, an A-duty NCO. They're assigned to just watch the barracks. It's their job to basically be like a hall monitor. Um, <laughs> uh, what, is, what is it called in college? An RA, a resident assistant, like where they live there, and they're like, here are the rules. There you go. Echo, confirmed? Yep. Cool. Yeah. Confirmed. Okay. Confirmed. Were Solid you copy. RA, Echo Charles? No. Okay. Back. <laughs> right. Crazy. Okay. okay. Yeah. But one of one of these guys, he's a machine gunner. His name was Chad. 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 Machine gunners are wild. <laughs> they're they're wild dudes in general, right? Um, Chad would uh, he would he would love to have a good time, and every now and then Chad would become Super Chad, <laughs> and he would he would drunkenly draw an S on his chest oh, backwards because yeah. he, he would do it wrong in the yeah. mirror, <laughs> and then he would tie his poncho liner to himself, yeah. and that the worst thing you would want to see is one of your very best friends become their alter ego as you're like Chad, please, and he's like Super Chad, and he's running around the barracks and silkies just out of his mind, and you're just like, come on, dude, just get to the thing, please. I don't want to. I'm already going to be up for a day, please. And it's like that every single day. And we were tame. We were tame. My wife picked me up once, weapons company. So it's just a whole company of weapons dudes. She picked me up and a guy jumped off the third deck balcony onto some mattresses he had set up and combat rolled out of it. She goes, what's happening? I go, we're leaving. We're leaving. I don't, I don't cope. Come on, babe. We got to go. She goes, he okay? And I was like, Did you knows? try and keep a minimum safe distance for your wife when yeah. she would roll in? Were you like, hey, meet me on this intersection over here? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're a bunch of... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, like, y- you know, it's just, they were fine, and they were, everyone was respectful and stuff, but, like, it's just a bunch of dudes, and if somebody says something, like, it's on, dude, like, yeah. hey, watch yourself, and, you know, um, but, like, it's it's crazy, it's not, people say it's like a frat house, I think frat houses are tame compared to, like, Super Chad and things like that, yeah. but, I mean, these are also your very best friends, so it's, it's just, I don't know, it's yeah. fun. There's always this tinge, too, I... That don't that, do that in the teams. You'll have super teams or whatever. Oh, okay. dude, we got all kinds of freaking knuckleheads. You're looking at one of them, by the way. You know, yeah. so um, there's always that tinge of like, well, you know, we could die. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, yes, we could die. So we're gonna live, and we're gonna live a lot, especially Friday night, Saturday oh, yeah. night. Like, we're gonna live. We're gonna make sure we're gonna we're gonna be ready, but we're gonna we're gonna live real good. Oh yeah, we we would leave. We would you know. Um, at that time, somebody text super Chad. <laughs> we, yeah. we have a scenario. No. Yeah. I mean, he's going to love that. I said this to you too. Um, Cause I have a photo of him and I just took a photo of him and we're like trying to calm him down and no one's home sure. and he has a backward S on his chest. <laughs> but um, like uh, the barracks would either be hot, too hot or too cold. And like all my friends would be like, let's go to Bell's house. And so we would like have these crazy one year we had a luau. So like all my friends from the company, it's legendary, would come over and we had like a themed party at my house 
And it was just like I came to work the next day, and the company first sergeant was like, hey, doggone bell, I heard you had a doggone luau at the house. And I was just like, <laughs> yes, I did, first sergeant. Everyone's fine. He goes, next time, let, let a first sergeant know. And I was like, oh, okay, we're like that. Hey, I didn't know. Okay. Hey. But, like, we would live because especially after coming back from war, you understand so much more about life, so much more about the precious reality of time. And like you're you're stuck with they're they're here they're they're right here forever, you know. And um, all of them and like my wife always says they're they're like her her little brothers, you know. And they're they're the uncles to my children. That's what they call uncles, you know, Uncle Ace, you know, Uncle, uncle whoever. Like that's who they they refer to, Uncle Luke, all of them. And um, it's just such a special bond. But it's it's crazy looking back on it. Like I I. I would des if I could you know go back I'd be like yeah w- one barracks night it would be so much fun yeah oh hundred um, percent so now you do another workup yeah and now you're a little bit more seasoned yes sir how's that going all good it's going really great actually um yeah uh, they had told us we're going to Iraq for thirty days at that point excuse me and um okay like, hey, you're going to Iraq. 30 days and I was like 30 days in wait Iraq. in 30 days or are you gonna go there for, for 30 like 30 days? days was it like to shut down or something to shut like down that? bases they were like you're shutting down bases and I was like 30 I'll do Iraq I'll get fat in Iraq I don't care give me a gym give me a chow hall give me Wi-Fi let's go dude mm-hmm. let's go and they're like as we get close to it they're like hey it might be 60 days I don't care I don't care I don't care I don't care you know, because now Iraq, this is 2000. Are we in 2010? Yet? 2009. 2009. 2008. Yeah, Iraq has really the, settled down by 2009. Oh, yeah. There's nothing. There's the, it's lights. You know, it's just like people were like, it's magical. I remember I would see photos of people in Iraq and they had like clean camis. And I was oh, like, yeah. bro, they're fine. Uh, they're fine. <laughs> Leif, Leif deployed with SEAL Team One and they had one casualty there and it was a vehicle flip over that type of airport. stuff was happening yeah. there was a guy who died from like a forklift accident like yeah. it was you know non-combat stuff and it's horrible anytime life is lost but like you're looking at it from my perspective am i going to conduct combat operations no that was what we've done mm-hmm. and so we had uh, wanted to uh, have another child and uh, you know we found out my wife was pregnant again and it was awesome i was like yeah cool this is great i'm gonna be a dad again <laughs> and um everything was going great until <laughs> Uh, you know, President um, Obama at the time went to West Point in November of 2009. And uh, that day they go, hey, the president's going to announce a troop surge in Afghanistan. You're going to a town called Marja. You have two weeks. And like, I remember when they told Was me. Was this, how how long had you been home for? The whole year. I've been okay. home since October of 08. So you had completed your whole workup. Whole work you guys weren't deployable. Because occasionally like people get deployed yeah. out of sync and they just have to leave early or whatever yeah at that time that stuff had kind of gone by the wayside mm-hmm. and it's not really existing anymore it was a like senior guys had done that in iraq but this this wasn't that mm-hmm. so you had a full workup you're yeah. ready to go to iraq shut things down be a logistics crew yeah and hold security on some stuff That's exactly what it was holding those, security yeah all good and now you find out you're how how long till you go on deployment we had three weeks from the time they told us I know that because of how much I got gouged on every, you know, storage unit and everything under the sun. Because all of one six, I was just being told to do that, and there were other units too. But it was it was one six that was being told. So it was my, my heart broke. How good was your intel on Marja at the time? No one really knew about it. No one really talked about it. The only thing we knew at that time, and we would find out later, it was it was perceived as the last Taliban stronghold in Helmand Province. Did you find that out? Like, did you Google it? I started, so when I started transitioning to like a leadership role Mm -hmm. and stuff, like I started to make the military my job. And that was because of Ryan. He he once told me, he's like, not everyone gets to re-enlist. When it comes time, you need to be in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. People submit packages and people get asked to submit packages, but not everyone, even when they submit a package, gets asked to do it. Make sure you have the ability and you get asked to do it. Treat this like a job. And so I did. So I had I was like constantly studying, looking up stuff, trying to understand things yeah. wherever I could. And at that time, I had even done a workup as a team leader for a few months because he went off to squad leader school. Um, excuse me, I done a workup as a squad leader because he went off to squad leader school. So I went from being a team you leader, it. and I was running mm-hmm. it. Like I ran ranges, we did training, all, all this crazy stuff. So I was like, I'm I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. Because when time comes, I want to have all the power to make that decision. And check, yeah. So you go on deployment and you end up uh, you're rolling into Operation Mosh Tarek. Am I saying that right? 
I, I think I didn't yeah. even know that. Na- I didn't even yeah. know that name until uh, we got back. Okay. It's Marja. Yeah. yeah. So it's a it's Marja. Yeah. And this is there's a lot of stuff going on. Like you said, it's the surge. So yeah. now it's the surge happening. They had done the surge in Iraq. It kind of worked. Yeah. And that was the theory that it would work here. Yeah. yeah it it worked. It, it kind of worked in in Iraq. If we wouldn't have totally left, it would have worked really well. But we completely left. But at that time, they were like, oh, yeah, it worked. Like, yeah. we sent more troops over there. We got into the seize, clear, hold, build deal going on. Yes. We, you know, did more interaction with the local governmental officials to get them squared away. So there's a bunch of things that went well. So now they take that, they pick it up, and they bring it over. And now we're going to do this in Afghanistan. Um, I, I know, like, General McChrystal, General McChrystal, one of the things he said was uh, basically – we got a government in a box. We, we like have yeah. the Afghans we're going to use. We're going to insert them yes. once we take over. And the rules of engagement, one of the things I heard to describe the rules of engagement was courageous restraint, which is a, a very positive way of spinning up the way the rules of engagement are, meaning it's going to take courage to do what we're asking you to do. Um, Sounds like something a general would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does sound like something a general would say. Things were different out there on the front. I can tell you that right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's what this is all about. And, yes, sir. You know, the I have a leadership company called Echelon Front. Yes, you do. And the reason the company's called Echelon Front is because it's leadership from the front. Yes. Like, what is happening on the front? Not leadership from back in the rear, from the rear Echelon motherfuckers, but the front. So... Um, in the rear, courageous is restraint. Sounds pretty good. Till you're getting freaking shot at. Yeah. Sounds uh, super cool until you until that happens. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what he was talking about. Just so we're just so we're clear, I want this on the record. That was not what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um So when you land, what's the deal when you land? Do, do you how's that briefing happen? How are you hearing about it? How's this operation kind of take shape in for you? What are you now uh uh a Lance Corporal Lance team? Corp- team okay. leader. Um, what's, what's it look like from your perspective? Um, I mean, for me, there was so much that was happening personally. I mean, my wife was pregnant with our second child and like we had left abruptly and the, you know, all of the stress and strain at the last minute really, really worried me. Um, you know, like we left. In How the, pregnant is she? She do while you're on deployment or no? She would go on to have our child about a month later. And like, okay. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, yeah, she was very pregnant. Um, third trimester a few weeks out. Oh, okay. Like there's a photo of me like kissing her, her pregnant stomach yep. as she's holding our, our, our daughter. Um, and like, I was just, I was just, I, I was, I was there, I was doing my job, but like, I was just like, I, as I, I remember giving her like kissing my unborn child being like, I don't know if I can do this for 20 years. Mm-hmm. That was, that was just a real time thought. And, um, you know, we get there and from the very beginning i knew that this was different when we left there was fob dwyer when i got there there was a guy giving us like a red barrel brief and telling me a wi-fi password because it was now called camp dwyer Mm. and in that year the military industrial complex had moved right to that part of afghanistan and i was like what is happening this is like a big place with tents and chow halls and steak and lobster on sunday and all this stuff and there was so much more media attention, so much more assets, and intentional um, coverage of this that it, it made me uncomfortable from the jump. Like, they're like, you're working with the Afghans now. We were the first ones to do it. They brought out, like, the Afghan commander. They brought off like, the Afghan dude. Like, we were the first unit to do that that I know of. Um, and, like, we were just immediately, hey, you're going to town called Marja. Here's the thing. You know, it's a Taliban stronghold. Um, the reason we come to find out why is because how much uh, cultivation of poppy which is opium and heroin that comes from there and so that's their money source that's that's their fuel for the terrorism that they're going to conduct everywhere and so we wanted to take that from them so as you're rolling in this is a ma- this is a big operation is it is it the yeah. largest helo born assault since vietnam is what they would tell us every day every day four thousand americans are going in yeah so what what was the force structure so you had your battalion yeah Actually, I will not. I shouldn't have asked you that question because I I looked at the force structure yesterday. I was like reading reading about this battle, and it's just a ma- it's you know it's you massive. Got, it's massive. It's yeah. four thousand. It's yeah. like one six, almost a full brigade. Yeah, one six took took Marja. There was a unit. I think it's two six, I believe, or three six. I can't remember. They were to the north, and there was a army like strike team somewhere. Mm-hmm. They were to the south, but one six itself started inserted into Marja. Yeah, and plus you had Brits 
Brits were around, yeah. Something like 1,500 Brits, and they had some other Brits for reinforcements and 2,500 Afghans. Yes. That was that was rolling into this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, going back to that question I asked you, so now are you getting, you are you still getting like the main source of information for you is company level briefs? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what the Marine Corps does best is yep. like keeping it focused on our lane and like Ryan was like involving me more in like planning and stuff and treating me more like a, like a, I don't want to say, um, I can't think of the right word right now. He just, he was like talking to me more deliberately mm-hmm. about things were happening. Like the tone, everything was just the way everyone was moving was so different from the very beginning. I was like, this is, this is going to be wild. Yeah. Cause when you start doing this size of operation, this is, this is going to be some kind of historical operation. Most likely look yes. you could have go in there and they're just like they everyone folds over and take the town and It wouldn't be that big of a deal yeah. But if there's gonna be any level of fighting you have that many troops on the ground This is a historical operation that the Marine Corps is gonna learn lessons from they're gonna pass on like this is a big deal Yes, and you knew that like, yeah, I could tell by the way we were being covered There was news people everywhere. There was people talking about it Do you know this is being like I would call my wife home because we were still in the big bases She'd be like they're talking about this every day everywhere. They're talking about going into Marja mm-hmm. on the news. She knows it everyone knew about it Marja, yeah. yeah, like there's a, like a meme. It's like Marja, 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 and it's like I'm a Marja Marine, and it's like, look, no one cares, right? That's that's like how it felt, but because it was like literally happening. Like there's clips I've been able to pull and like things together. I mean, the the most famous thing that happened is the speech that Gunnery Sergeant Brian Walgren gave <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 14 years ago to the day yesterday yeah. to Alpha Company Marines. It was just our company alone. He was there. He was our company Gunnery Sergeant. You guys should like on a, you. You would love each other. Like he's incredible. He had had, so he came to us in AP Hill, and um, I was actually to go back. I was actually the training squad leader, mm-hmm. and everyone had failed this squad exercise, and I was bottom of the ninth. No one liked my plan. I'm the Lance Corporal squad leader. I shouldn't even be in this spot. Ryan's not there. I came up with a plan, and uh, I was like, "Here's what we should do. This is how we should maneuver." Put. I moved all my, I moved, um, my saw gunners to the top of the hill, provide a uh, fire superiority, mm-hmm. suppressing fire while my maneuver element was able to go through and clear an objective. Mm-hmm. Cover and move. I like Cover it. and move. <laughs> um, so I do it. I execute. Use the pop-up to signal all of it. I'm doing stuff that everyone's telling me not to do. I do it and I hear this, this roar, this rumble. And he goes, Marine, who is your squad leader? And I go, that's me. And he goes, God damn it, that just made my dick move. <laughs> and I go, do I have to do it again? He goes, no, you're the only one who doesn't. You're going to brief all the fucking idiots who failed. And I looked around. Every other squad leader was a sergeant and everyone but me. I had to like be like, I put two saw gunners on the hill and they did this. And he goes, are you a Lance Corporal? And I go, yes, gunnery sergeant. He goes, God damn it, I love the Marine Corps. And then like he gave this big speech. So he was like known for these like real raw, raw moments. Yeah. <laughs> but um, he, so he gives this speech, the John Glenn speech, and it's all the Marines of Alpha Company. It's funny too, like when he's giving that speech, he's like, have I given you this speech? Have I given you, if I've given you this guy's the John Glenn speech, like he has these things queued up. Yeah. <laughs> he's ready. Well, and he's, he is the most, most marine ever like he <laughs> he took stuff out of the connex box that he knew he didn't need and put in stacks of red bulls just the mini eight ounce ones because they're easier to they're easier to drink in a dynamic environment is what he once <laughs> told me and then he would smoke small short cowboy killers he didn't want to give away his position to the enemy so he's ripping butt smoking you know smoking cigarettes drinking coffee all it's 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 all real it's all real and he's one of one of the greatest leaders ever he he would go on to save my life many times. Like I, I literally love Brian Walgren, and um, like so, he would uh, he gave the speech and like we're there and that whole day we had been getting speeches from everyone, and I don't know if they did this during your time, but like a general comes out like, this might sound disrespectful or rude or whatever, but I don't want to hear a general's opinions. Like I don't want to like because we're in formation for like an hour and he's like, Marines, you're gonna go forth and do war like you're trained to do, and then a colonel comes out and then a lieutenant colonel like, so that's what he's talking about in the speech. He's like, I've heard these speeches all day, and then like, <laughs> even as I watch the video every year as I do, I can feel myself and I can see my dumb self actually as I'm like, this is such a crazy moment in my life that happened. And someone caught it, and I'm so grateful for it, but I'll honestly never forget it. And little did I know that that moment has now transcended to a point to where it's used in recruiting offices, ROTC, all these different things to this day. Every every time I put it up, people tell me all this stuff, but like. Yeah, it's on YouTube, it's on your Instagram, veteran, at, at veteran with a sign, you can watch it, because you just posted it, because it's 
You yeah. Know, this is like 14 years ago, almost to the day that yeah. we're sitting here today. Yeah. And um, it's, it's crazy because as soon as he wraps it, an hour later, we're on a bird. Mm-hmm. Like we, because we had so much gear, they were like trying to get us transpo, but we couldn't do it. So we walked across an unfinished field and got on the birds. And the we had so much weight, we actually threw water bottles away on the flight line just to so the birds could lift off. And then boom, straight to Marja. And where where were you, where was your platoon going? What was your what was your objective? We were in the center pushing out. That, that was Alpha Company's objective to like land into the area and push out. I mean, as I as I remember mm-hmm. it best I can, you know. Um, but we were just supposed to land there and then push. That's the same thing we we done before. Mm-hmm. Like the battle space will get reorganized according to whatever you know the, the battalion commander it's all fit at that time. Company here, wherever we were, but like. Alpha and Bravo, Charlie was to the south, I remember that, but Alpha and Bravo like pushed in and just were supposed to push out through the battle space and seize and clear. And this was a big, I mean, like you guys had Apaches, you guys had yes. Predators. Um, so you're flying in, what are you What are you anticipating as you're flying in as, a, they, how old are you now, 22? 22, seasoned a little bit more. I've got an M4203. Mm-hmm. Um, Get some. Yeah, it's my favorite weapon. So How so. many grenades did you have with you? Oh, 13. One in the Shit. gun, six on each side. Shit. So here's what I would do. I would rock six six on each side of my belt, mm-hmm. dump pouches, one in the gun, and then six mags on me, mm-hmm. maybe. But the one thing I know about the 203 is if you put one out out in the open, it, people get their heads down and allow you to move out of the mm-hmm. danger zone. So contact front, boom. <laughs> We'll figure it out. <laughs> it's like literally my method because people, they're so loud. They don't know the casual rate is not yeah, that big, yeah. but it's so like, they're like, oh no. And you're like, yeah, that's yeah, bad. So, but um, let us, let us think for a second. Yeah. Here. That's literally, it's literally just a tactical pause. Right. And so like, you know, they had told us it was going to be bad IDs everywhere. There was gonna be a part of a town that a soft unit had supposedly come through and they had in contact everywhere as well come to find out they just leveled that whole section like they mm-hmm. literally called in an airstrike there and leveled it um and we were carrying apobs actually we had re- i don't know what the right word is but we had we had um tied and like duct taped two by fours like so we were carrying them over our shoulders with our combat load um of apobs just so we could clear mm-hmm. what we thought would be like id laden areas and it was a nightmare. They're not; those were not made to be carried. They became smaller then, but they were not made to be carried. So, a napop is a you know, it's a minefield clearing device. It's a rocket up front. It shoots grenades yeah. off to the side to clear you know a dangerous area. Yeah, and they would normally be brought on a vehicle. Yes, <laughs> not, and the vehicle in this case was Marines. So yeah. So as you get on the ground, how's it go down? What's the resistance when you hit? Um, they, I mean, they're so smart at this point. They mm. knew we were coming. We had dropped flyers. We had dropped pamphlets. We had you know, done radio broadcasts, all the stuff that we can do to be like, Hey, leave. And, um, honestly, the locals were waiting. we saw them like, as we were, they were leaving, like, okay, whatever. And then as the birds started lifting off, it starts happening. You know, they're just looking for us, just hitting us with pop shots, waiting until we get to cover and then start attacking that place. And, you know, they knew exactly what we were going to do every step of the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, the initial clear phase wasn't, it was not as dynamic as the rest of the deployment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's almost like what the, I forget which island it was when the Marines landed. I forget which island it was off the top of my head, but the Marines landed one of the island campaigns and the, the enemy didn't do anything for, the Japanese didn't do anything yeah. for them. They let them get in there and let them kind of get settled. So it was, that's kind of the way it felt, to mm-hmm. be honest. I mean, like we would have like elements and stuff, and I knew some of the guys on like the stay teams, and they would like reach out and pop a few guys who were like dropping, you know, materials or whatever, mm-hmm. and different stuff like that. Like we we had pretty good, you know, battle superiority for a while, and you know, our company was pushed in position. They were rearranged to like the center of of the town. Mm-hmm. Yeah, basically, it, it, the way the way the history of the battle reads, it's like it basically day one or you know day two, yeah. you, everyone reaches their objectives. It's yeah, like, that's it was, what happens. We was quick. I, mean, I was covered. I was literally covered in sweat. All of us were like, we, we walked so much. It didn't seem like it made sense to me. Mm-hmm. And like, you can see it now in some of the photos I have. And thankfully my wife had told me to take my little silver, like Nikon, mm-hmm. but like all of us are just like emaciated pale and you can't eat enough to save your life there. And just pushing and pushing and pushing, shooting, pushing, shooting, pushing, shooting, pushing, take a building, hold it, shoot, shoot, make a plan, report, uh, report up, make a plan, move to the next building. There was an incident where some civilians got killed mm-hmm. by a, by a HIMARS. Um, 
artillery rocket and it was like a big deal right because it was 12 civilians killed mm-hmm. 10 of them i think were from the same family and i think that, that was bravo company yeah so this yeah. hit the news yes. and you know general mccrystal apologized and kind of banned the use of high mars from there on out mm-hmm. it was yeah it was another turn of events where i don't know if you guys were impacted by that no, no. I mean, we weren't, and I, I should say, if it wasn't Bravo Company, I don't know who it was. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just trying to remember this to the best of my knowledge. Um, recall this to the best of my knowledge, but, like, I mean, they would do things, like, they would take over buildings, and, um, you know, they would be like, there's civilians in here, but, like, you don't know that or not. Obviously, you would find, or they would say something happened after the fact, mm-hmm. but, I mean, that's all kind of a hindsight 2020 thing. Yeah. Um, and in general, they were smart enough to know that we were going to believe whatever they said, or they knew we were listening to their right. ICOM chatter. Mm-hmm. So you couldn't trust them. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm not saying any of that was true or not true. It's just like, you don't know. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and so w- we were always conscious of the civilians and everything. Cause you know, as soon as we got through, as soon as we got to our objectives, we started going through and doing a battle damage assessment. And that's what we did for like a month afterwards, just going around. How many people live here? What's your family's name? What's the damage done? Here's the form you got to give to the you know, civil affairs person. They'll cut you a check. In in Ramadi, we had the Haditha Dam mm-hmm. story, or the Haditha story had just broken, and so like you could see, the Marines were very concerned about what they were doing because there was so much scrutiny on because of what had happened in Haditha or mm-hmm. allegedly happened in Haditha. So I and I, you know, we had the same thing happen. Like if there were civilian casualties in Ramadi, it would be definitely turn up the the volume of or. I guess turn up the intensity of scrutiny of what's happening, make sure everyone's doing the right thing. So if you have 12 civilian killed in an operation where everyone's got their eyes on it anyways, like that's just going to be yeah. a bit of a gut check. And it was. I mean, there was there were so many people everywhere documenting it. They went on to make a documentary about it called The Battle of Marja that Ben Johnson, you know, and some of the guys' advice had made. Like there was news there every single day, people covering Have you watched that documentary? Uh-huh. How is it? I thought it was actually an accurate portrayal. You know, yeah. I it only highlighted one company, um, mm-hmm. which is Bravo Company, and Ben. You know, he he was a, he uh, he had told me he'd been in war since the nineties. Mm-hmm. You know, covering like you know stuff in Africa and things like that. He's a very very good guy. Ben Anderson, not Johnson. Mm-hmm. Ben Anderson, and um, like I feel like it shows everything that had happened as much as you can. Um, it's just. This is something I still struggle with, and I don't know if I ever will find peace on it, is it's really hard to have this moment in my life that's so publicly consumed and um, dissected, you know, by especially by people who weren't there or who haven't done a version of this. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's like a it's it's like a I don't say it's like a wound that never heals, but it's it's just kind of like a a thing that's hard sometimes. Mm-hmm. Because everyone who has like a negative opinion on it, I don't really care what they have to say because they've never done anything about it or they say they would do something differently. And I don't, I don't want to hear that. Uh, you weren't there. You don't know. You know, we're making the best decision with the stuff we had at the time. But like it's this thing that's become like larger than just my deployment. It's something that, you know, went on to become a marketing campaign for the Marine Corps, went on to become something that people talk about. And it's it's hard to make peace with that legacy sometimes. At, at least I haven't. What's like? What's the negative press or whatever i mean it's just you know um like you know people say stuff these days like uh you know sorry lost your friends for lies or things like that like people will say stuff like that and again i don't don't really care about what trolls say you know more about that than anyone or anyone online knows about that but like i just don't understand um i don't i don't I don't really know how I feel about it still because it, it took so much from me, mm-hmm. you know, and it, it took, it took some Marines for me, you know, and it, you know, some of them, some of them didn't come home there. And then some of them, you know, some of them we lost when we came home and, uh, it's, it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really hard. I'm, I'm sorry. I just, only the dead have seen the end of war. And um, it's weird to see my life on on such a public display the way it is. I, I don't. I just just that one thing. Mm-hmm. You know, everything else I've kind of finely tuned and created to where I am now. But like, 
you know, when I think about the things that I've had to work through from that moment in particular, it's, it's just hard. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sorry. Does that make Does that make sense? No, it does. Because um, you're, if I was to try and translate that, it's like you have your interpretation. Yeah. And then you have all these other people with their interpretations that are maybe at odds or battling with or agree and disagree with certain parts of what you actually saw and lived through. Mm-hmm. And it can be hard to reconcile those things uh, of how, how do you, or let me rephrase that, how do you reconcile those things? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'll tell you, for me, it's sort of like I know what I did and what I saw. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, and I, and I also know that I didn't see everything. Yeah. And that I didn't, that different people saw different things. And just like, different people have different perspectives of what happened. And so, you know, my mind is just sort of like, yeah, there's, I had my experience and other people had their experiences and they're gonna be, they're of course they're gonna be a little bit different. And people that weren't actually there at all, they can kind of say what they want. It's not yeah. really, it's yeah. not, I, I, their perspective doesn't have a whole lot of weight with me. No, and know. I'm I'm getting to that place now. It's just it's just been hard, and and you know, especially because like I'm in this position now to where like I try to be an advocate advocate for all those, especially who didn't make it home, you know, and the ones we've lost when we came home about this work, you know, because like um, if you don't dig in to invest in yourself and to find out what happened, it's it's just a slow attrition of your soul, in my opinion, um, because. You know, everyone who says they're not different after war is a liar or they need help because you should be different after war. You should. If you're like, I'm fine, <laughs> and like you're really fine, then you, you need to talk to someone because otherwise if those experiences haven't changed you or shaped you, then you're just not being honest to that experience. Yeah, and, and the way I look at that kind of thing is like, um, oh, oh, you, you get sad when you think about the friends you lost. That's totally normal. It is normal. And it's okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, if you were like, oh, I lost my friends and I don't care, I'm moving on, that you're right, that would be weird. <laughs> would, you, you probably, Scary. You, yeah, but most guys, unfortunately, they think, well, I'm sad when I, I feel I feel sad that I lost friends. And they think there's something wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that, of course. Mm-hmm. You, you know, you get, you, uh, you know, Memorial Day. Memorial Day is really hard for me. Yeah, of course. It should be. Lost a bunch of friends. Yeah. Yep, that's the way it is. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. That's okay. And again, for me, that's, at some point I realized that, oh, actually I can tell you when I realized it. I was doing a podcast with a guy who had served in World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And he was an enlisted guy in World War II and then he became an officer in Korea and then he was served in Vietnam. And we were just talking, we, we got all the way to Vietnam and he was a battalion commander in Vietnam. And I, I said, you know, we were talking what they were doing and what missions they were doing and et cetera. And I, I started asking him about casualties and he started getting choked up and i thought to myself oh this is normal Mm -hmm. the guy's been out of vietnam war for 60 years and he's thinking about the guys that he lost and he's getting choked up this is what it is this is this is normal and it's okay and that's when i I, that that actually helped me out a lot, mm-hmm. and I as soon as I processed, I didn't process it at the time. I kind of did process it at the time. I was like, because I was surprised. You know, you're talking to a guy that had lost guys in his battalion sixty years prior, mm-hmm. and you think, oh, okay. What I thought to myself was, I'm always going to feel like this, and that's perfectly fine. The guy had a normal life. I mean, he got done with his career in the army, carried on with the career in the civilian sector. After he retired from the army, so it's like, oh, okay, yep. Oh, you feel bad that you lost your friends? Yep, totally yeah. normal. Yeah. What is it they say? Grief is just love with no place to go. That's what I think about. This is all very new. I've I've been think I've been able to do a lot of like really deep deep dive therapies on this. You know, I did I did the retreat through vets. You know, they were able to help me out. Uh, you know, went south of the oh, border for like ayahuasca. And uh, I began in DMT. You know, it really helped me to you know kind of put stuff in place. And, um, you know, it's just, it's just tough. I, I don't know. Cause like we as a culture, especially, and it all comes from, it all comes from this. When I, when I went on my first appointment, we came back, there were guys that said they were messed up and they couldn't do anything and they didn't feel good. And the way we cast them out as cowards, 
weak and less than because at that time if you weren't deployable you weren't useful and if you're a coward you don't want to do it you're nothing to us get out leave we hate you you're done go away that's stuck that's stuck with i think it's stuck with a whole generation mm-hmm. of, of dudes um because like you start to view that that um that desire for help as weakness because if you're not deployable then you're not promotable if you're not promotable then you're done Mm-hmm. They had ways of not calling it that, but you know, six months not promotable, your career's dead. You're done. That's a wrap. See you around later. Adios, goodbye. And I, I think it stuck. It definitely stuck with me way longer than I ever should have. You know, because the thing that made me good as an infantryman was the thing that hurt me the most. I could put stuff in my pack and I carried it a long way, to a point where that pack got too heavy, and then it started to hurt everything around me. So I had to work on that. Yeah, that's another thing I, I learned from the book About Face by Hackworth. He talks about the fact he's like, yeah, some guys, great guys, and they could do anything. And at a certain point, their cup. He he said everyone's got a cup, and that people have different size cups. And when they get overfilled, that they can't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And he said it's nothing against them. It's like if I was mad at you because you were sh- how tall are you five seven. Like I, if I was mad at you because you weren't six foot. Yeah, I can't hold that against you. Mm-hmm. That's just what you. That's just the way you are. Mm-hmm. It's and and different people are different ways. And if Hackworth is saying that after. Being in, in Korea and Vietnam, like you go, okay, this guy understands this situation. Mm-hmm. And so that's for me, another thing that helped me out was, oh yeah, the guy's just got a smaller cup and needs a break. Yeah. And that's something I, I learned from Dick Winters is guys, if their cup starts getting close, you gotta get them out of the out of the combat yeah. for a little while and give them a little rest because they can empty out that cup on their own. But if it overflows, man, there's there's water everywhere and it's a disaster. So yep. you got to get the guys, which unfortunately what you're talking about, if you got a guy that says, hey, I can't do this right now, you say, okay, cool. We you know we need somebody to train Marines. We need somebody <laughs> to work over here. You can work on the range. You give them some kind of downtime yeah. and they can adjust. But if you say, oh, you're a coward, well, that's, yeah, that's, definitely, that's definitely not going to help because now they think there's something wrong with them. Well, there's nothing wrong with them. They just need a little break. Because humans are not really meant to do this for an extended period of time and over and over again. You're just not, not really meant for it. Are you meant to you know, get four of your friends together and go kill the woolly mammoth or whatever as cavemen? Yeah, you're meant to do that. We're scared. Yeah, now we got meat for two months, right? We're good. But we're not meant to just get exposed to that over and over again. Your friends are getting killed. You're scared of getting blown up and dying. You got all the pressure from the system itself of are you making the right decisions at the right time? So you add all that stuff up. That can make a person break if you're not careful. Well, and and for me, and personally, just to go back, like prior to the mission launch, um, I'd had this, uh, my my wife was still, was I, so, Prior to finding out my second daughter had been born, all my friends were trying to get word, right? And we didn't have a phone or anything. And uh, we were probing the security sector prior to the launch into Marja, and I took out these French reporters. And Ryan assigned them to me, and he's like, they're your responsibility. And I was like, please, Lord, no. (laughs) He's like, they're yours. And I was like, okay. We went out and contact and they drop they go flat they go flat like two crepes instantly they're like no no and i'm like come on dude we got to go we got to go and he's like no miss you we're not going and i was like you're not going he's like you need to go or you're gonna die no no no. we're scared and i was like i get it you're french but you got to go we got to leave <laughs> and so like and he goes no 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 no. and that's so i grab him by the back of his flag and i was like move and like as i'm doing it i'm like popping off rounds and we go back we get to the patrol base and everything you know, and he gets back and he goes, Monsieur, you have saved my life and I'm so grateful for you and all this stuff. And I go, oh, that's really, really cool. Um, and, you know, I'm glad I was able to do that. And he goes, you ever need anything from me or the associate de press, you let me know. And I go, actually, I need something from you. My wife is pregnant with my second child and I'm trying to find out if she's giving birth to our daughter. I know you're from the Associated Press and I imagine they sent you out here with a cell phone. <laughs> Will you please let me borrow that cell phone so I can call home and see if my daughter's born? It won't be long. It'll be a quick thing. And I'll get right back to you. And he goes, uh, regretfully, I do not have a cell phone. And I was like, what do you What do you mean? And he goes, no cell phone. I was like, they sent you out here without a cell phone? And he goes, we. Oui. I go, okay. Well, here's the deal, Jock. Either you're going to give me that cell phone, or I swear to God, I'm going to take your ass back out there, and I'm going to leave you, and no one's going to stop me. No one's ever going to find you. 
And by this time, all my Marines are there and they're looking at him and they're cracking knuckles and they're like, we'll, we'll do it. We'll do it in a heartbeat, dude. We don't care. You know, USA, USA. And he opens up his flak and he looks at me, hands me the phone and he goes, um, America's country code is zero one. And I grabbed it and I go, you're goddamn right it is. <laughs> and so I went and I called my wife and I found out my, my daughter was born and all these things. And immediately after, as I handed the phone back to him, explosions were going off. And then like, those moments are sealed in my brain and jump cut months later. We're now in Marja and that's happening every single day, every single day that's happening. And I just, I can feel it. I can feel the pressure. I can feel the danger. We didn't do security patrols. We didn't do contact patrols. We did combat patrols. That's how I, that's how they were briefed to me. And that's how I briefed them. And as the spring offensive started happening, they started cultivating the poppy and everything else. We, um, my platoon, um, we, we lost a Marine. We lost a Marine in our platoon. And, um, you know, he was, he was a really good kid. He was the best, one of the best Marines ever met in my entire life. And, um, when, when we lost, when we lost Philip, I, I don't, I don't think any of us were ever prepared for anything like that. And, you know, it, uh, nobody did anything wrong. Nobody made any mistakes. It was just what happened. And, um, uh, we, after that had happened, there was a reorganization of the platoon. There was a reorganization of the entire company. Not long after that, because we had to break up different platoons. We had to make them smaller to uh, stretch ourselves out across the battle space. And, um, first sergeant and the CO, they sat down, they talked to us and they talked to me and they said, Zach, do you want to do this? And I said, I'll do it. I'll, I'll take, I'll take those Marines. I'll, I'll lead them because in addition to Philip, um, well, the squad leader as well was injured, but he was, he was injured in the incident as well. So we were down a squad leader and down a Marine and our platoon was hurting. And they asked me if I could do it. And I said, I'll do it or die trying. And that's what I did. The remainder of the deployment It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Hands down, hands down the hardest thing I've ever done. You know, everyone was hurt. Everyone was scared. And it was just my job to, hey, we got to go. And so by the time that had happened, I had started to make the decision that I wasn't going to do this anymore. You know, um, we lost him. And then we we literally had to just continue the mission. We had until, you know, we were there until July something to the 20th, something like that. And we were we were doing ops twice a day then every day and they were not stopping they were not stopping it got more and more dangerous one of my marines got injured you know he was in a truck a ricochet hit him you know we didn't we didn't know a bullet had hit him actually it had hit the mvg plate and he was talking to me as his, you know he was in my hands they pulled him out of the truck you know gunnery sergeant brian walker and actually showed up to come <laughs> He had turned a logistical supply train, unbeknownst to the battalion. I'll say this publicly: he had turned it to a mobile section. But he had come he had originally. He's like, it's a, lo, it's a it was a logistics train. But he had turned his his company platoon. He had turned it to a mobile section. And um, you know, he came there and he had, you know he had provided a Kazavax. We were able to get him out of there. And um, he was actually uh, he had snapped me out of it when I was I was you know trying to get the blood off my hands you know, trying to figure out what to do next. And it was just, you know, that's the stuff I think about when people were, you know, asking what it was like or how it was. It's just those moments of, you know, until then I had been in positions of, of uh, influence, but when I was in a position of leadership, that's what I really understood the burden of command. Because no one knows what it's like when you give an opinion, but when you got to make a decision, turn left or turn right, that's when everything changes. And it changed for me. And so when they came to me and, you know, they're like, Zach, do you want to reenlist? And it was the same day one of my friends lost both of his legs and went on to become a Paralympic sled hockey player and win a gold medal. But at the time, I, I thought I'd lost another friend. I was like, no, I don't want to reenlist. I want to go home. I want to be a, I want to be a husband and a father. Yeah, that, um, that they, they officially declared that operation over in December. Yeah, December seventh, um, and and it it got worse the whole time. Like you were saying, like literally, uh, like we did a rip. The guy, two guys died in the rip. Yeah, one of the guys I took on, 
one of the guys I took out, his name was Lieutenant Zimmerman. He didn't make it much longer after that. Again, nobody was doing anything wrong. It's a game of numbers and it's a game of math. You do more patrols, there's just a higher chance of risk. Every time, it's just literally the more chance there is for variability, the higher the risk is. And they that was the unit that replaced us. And I mean, by that time, they had all the money from all the opium and they were they were just making bombs and things mm-hmm. every day. Um. So now you're going home. Going when, home. when was your reenlistment supposed to have? When when was your EOS? Uh, so uh, February 11th, 2011. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but they offered me a package. They're like, "Hey, you can do this. You can get like 30 grand. You got to deploy again." I remember just sitting in a tent smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I was like, "Not a chance." <laughs> I was like, "My first sergeant even came to me, and he was um, he had actually been there with my friend Luke when he got injured." And uh, he he told me he hated me. He hated me. I was kind of. I don't know if you've gathered. I'm a, I'm a scoundrel. I was a scoundrel then. Like I had long. I had a low reg. We call it a Navy SEAL reg. Is that what you guys call it? I thought I was whatever. Like <laughs> he once brought me out and said, "Wait, Wait is a low reg referring to your haircut?" That was what I had. A low reg. So it was barely long on the top, barely oh, faded okay. on the sides. He once brought me in front of the company and said, Marines, you get a haircut this weekend. Don't look like goddamn Bell. Like, <laughs> what thinks he's a fucking movie star or something? <laughs> like, because I would do it the high end slide. It would go up and I'd slick it to the side and put it in the Check. back. But um, he once told me, he's like, I, I hated you, Bell. <laughs> he's like, but now I, he's like, you're not bad. You don't need to do this anymore. That's what he told me. Mm-hmm. He told me, he's like, you're a husband, you're a father. He's like, don't do this anymore. Don't miss your family's life. He's like, go home. I'm proud of you. And then, like, that's legit. He's like, Sass Arndini's going to come in here. He's going to tell you some bullshit. Don't fucking fall for it. <laughs> and, like, he, he left. I was like, God, that's I had so so many great leaders in my life. You know, contrary to my life prior to that, I had these people that, like, really cared and taught me so much. And, like, there's just these moments that stick with me. And so when we came, we came back in July, my wife's like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I want to go to college. Let's go back home. Let's go move to Nashville, Tennessee, where she's from, and let's, let's start there. Let's do, let's do that. And that's what we did. We packed the car, you know, a 26 foot trailer. I put everything in there and we left, we left Camp Lejeune and the four of us and onto our great adventure. How did it feel last time taking off your uniform and saying goodbye to the boys? It broke my heart. You know, those are the only family I ever really had. There still are, but like, you, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the first one to leave, but I was a lot, I was like close to the last, you know, it's, it's tough because your your concern is who's going to look out for them. No one will love them or look out for them the way you will. And uh, you know, it's it sucks. I don't I don't know. I I still think about it. I always wonder what like, what happened if I would have stayed in. You know that that shift. Like, I wanted to be an officer is what I was going to do. I didn't I didn't know you had to go to college and stuff like that. I didn't know that. I thought they just go. You, son. You know, I thought they'd just hey, come here. Mm. And, you know, and then a nobleman, you know, he, he like, he does like a secret handshake and you're like, and you like level up and you're, you're like, oh, no. And if the war is big enough and bad enough. That does happen. It's called the Battlefield Commission. Get what? some. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> the last one in 1967 or something like that. Yeah. I don't. I, there hasn't been one since Nam. I'm yeah. almost sure. Yeah. It was it was in Nam. I think yeah. it was the last one. But I was, you know, I feel like there was more than enough stuff that happened. Not with me, but just anyone. I kind of wanted to see it happen. But. Um, I just, you know, I, cause I wanted a, a longer career, a higher quality of life, more family time. Those are the things I was looking at because mm-hmm. my goal was to try and stay with the infantry if I stayed in, but I wasn't gonna be able to stay enlisted. Like you just can't run that. You can't run that that long. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, but I just, uh, I wanted to go to college and no one in my family had ever done that. And I wanted to be the first and the GI bill, they're talking a lot about it and how it had changed and all this stuff. You get like a housing allowance. And I was like, okay, let's, 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 let's see if that dog hunts. And <laughs> it, it, you know, off to college I go. So, but before we did that, actually, the craziest thing of all is I want, I desperately wanted to be a dad and a father so much that 30 days after I got back from Afghanistan, I'm in Disney world with my wife and two children and it's funny because when I'm in the sun, my hair gets really, really, really blonde. And so it's still blonde from Afghanistan. But like I'm posing with like Tinkerbell and Mickey Mouse. And so it's the most jarring like 30 day journey ever. Me being like smile mm-hmm. and like just trying to be a dad again. But that's all I wanted. It's all I've ever wanted. Mm-hmm. Be a husband and a father. It's the best title I've ever had. Those two. 
But we did that. We went home, and then we started trying to, you know, build a life together. Mm-hmm. So it was going to college. What did you get your degree in? <laughs> um, a few things. Uh, at first, it was rough. I um, The GI Bill is good, and it's great. 2011, education wasn't where it needs to be with, like, VA certifying officials and things like that. So I had to bounce around a few schools until I found one that stuck. You know, there was only one school that accepted at that time. It was uh, Middle Tennessee State, and I did like a year there, and it was like an hour away from where we lived. And so I eventually like moved over um, to uh, a different uh, a community college and um, was there for a year, and then I was able to go to a, a small private uh, Christian university based on Nashville called Lipscomb. And that's where I graduated the and bachelor's. That, and that was all on the GI Bill. On the GI Bill. I got a bachelor's and a master's. I got a bachelor's with the GI Bill. And then with voc rehab, I was able to get a master's. What voc rehab? Vocational rehabilitation is a program that the VA has designed where they can give veterans, if they qualify for it, extra education, job experience, or training in order to get the things they need to succeed in the career field. And at that time, the position I was in, I needed a higher level, graduate level degree. So I took my proposal to my case manager, and everyone should look into this. Mm-hmm. And then they approved it, and I was able to get my master's. What were you? How were you up paying for your family at this time? Like, how are you buying diapers and freaking? Uh, oh, I was working uh, a ton of jobs. Okay, so you're just working on the side. So the first job I had uh, after the Marine Corps, I couldn't find a job anywhere. Like, I literally went to a hotel and applied for a security job, and they said I was unqualified for any role of security, <laughs> and uh, had a real veteran moment to say the least in the park uh, as I left. And I was like, "What do you mean I'm not qualified for it?" Six months ago, I was in Afghanistan, God's most austere environment, but I can't what check Titan, the Tennessee Titans into this hotel before the game day. She's like, "Oh well," and it was just a whole thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, but I couldn't find a job anywhere, and um, I had done like jobs before all this, like working in hospitals because they always have jobs mm-hmm. and they pay really well. And so I applied at uh, Vanderbilt Children's Hospital. And I decided to work there as a medical receptionist. It's the only job I get. No one else was hiring. No one cared. And I got that job while also working construction with my father-in-law as a day laborer. But once a week, he would let me go apply to jobs. And so for three years is what I did. I would get up and go to school, like 8 to 12. Then I would, you know, um, get some lunch. And then I would sleep in my car for like a few hours. And then from like 3 to 5, I would work out. And then from 5 to 7, I would drive from school to work. And then I would work 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And then Tuesday morning, my day was done. And then I would rinse and repeat for three years. And that's what I did. Mm-hmm. When so Marine Corps sounded like maybe one too bad. <laughs> the Marine, there was a real moment where I was like, <laughs> Afghanistan wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. But like it, it taught me a lot of things. One, um, no one cares about your military experience, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. It's not that it's bad, but it doesn't mean that it puts you in a leg up too. There's literally nothing I can't do or, or won't do to provide for my family. I didn't blink. Um, I didn't even – most of the people I worked with didn't even know I was in the Marines, like, at all. Like, the Internet was new then. Um, Instagram was new then. And only a few of my friends I worked with, like, around Veterans Day, saw photos of me, like, in Afghanistan. And then they started telling everyone that the guy – I'm sure they thought I was crazy or something. So I was just a dude with weird weird tattoos and work, working a job that elderly women, for the most part, worked, which is not a bad, but I was the only one as a medical receptionist. And they were like, hey, is this you? And it's, like, me with a grenade launcher. And I'm like, yeah, it's me. And they're like, why are you here? And I was like – well, because you don't care about me. <laughs> like, no, it's just like, it's the only job I can get. And I'm, I'm grateful. I'm able to do my schoolwork at night. I got all A's through college because of that. And it was hard, but I, I didn't blink. And I did that until I was able to get a job working at a nonprofit, helping veterans. And then they kept transitioning that into for-profit healthcare and just grind, 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 push. So you end up with regular jobs. like Eventually, but like the first job for the first three years, that's mm-hmm. what I was doing. Right, okay, so th- after those three years, you graduate from college yeah. now. I got my bachelor's, and then I did an adult degree program to get my master's, which meant I would go to college on like Tuesdays and Thursdays And what'd you nights. get your degrees in, so, these two degrees? So the bachelor's I got in psychology, because at that time, they were trying to add like an upper level graduate psychology program, like uh, industrial organizational psychology. But by the time I graduated, that program wasn't ready yet. And a buddy of mine told me to apply for the MBA program. And I was like, I did. And I got into it. So I was like, all right, let's do that. So you have your MBA? Yes, I do. Okay. Master's in business. And then what was your first, like, what was your career going to be? 
Um, and so Nashville, the two biggest industries are music and healthcare. Uh-huh. It's the healthcare capital of the world. And uh, so there's all these and like your guitar skills weren't up to par. I mean, I know G, C, E minor, and D. Hell yeah, you know? I that's mean, all you need. <laughs> hey, yeah, you can play every song in the church yes, off of that. Can. Almost all country songs are those scores yeah. too. Um, this is where me and you cut and yeah. we sing. Let's like, go. let's roll. I mean, I've seen the one of you in Tulsa, but I'm not <laughs> as good as either one of you. And she's incredible. But um, no, I um, you know, I just want to do a healthcare job. It's mm-hmm. kind of what everyone tells you to do. Mm-hmm. There's, it's very lucrative. It's always going to be around. Blah blah blah. And um, you know, I just did that. I worked in for profit and nonprofit healthcare. So I started with the nonprofit veterans organization. Mm-hmm. I moved into. And what are you actually doing? Uh, the What's first your job. The first job I started out was like um, a community relations manager. Is a, like a nonprofit. So it's like my job to partner with veterans organizations and to see how our organization could work with them. Okay. Right. And it's called Centerstone Military Services. It wasn't called that at the time, but we had, you know, on person, I mean, uh, online and in person counseling. And we would partner with people like Team Rubicon, Mission Continues, Simper Five Fund, mm-hmm. things like that. And then we were, instead of like creating a program that they have, we just partner. Right. And then I moved into like um, a, a different role at a company that didn't exist much longer after that <laughs> in 2016, um, where I was like a strategic sales manager. So it was my job where I managed like 50. Um, healthcare solutions, and I would match them to community-based hospitals all over the nation. Like one thing is a charge master. It's the mm-hmm. machine that decides how a patient's charged, put those into small places, find the charges that the systems are using aren't finding, and then do things like that. Or, you know, patient repayment options, all those different things to try and increase revenue of these very, very small facilities that honestly are keeping a lot of these towns alive. Mm-hmm. And you wrote some articles too yeah. for like New yeah. York Times articles and stuff like that? Yes, sir, I did. So how did you get into that? Um, a good friend of mine, uh, Thomas Mitchell Gibbons Neff, um, who I served with and we were in boot camp together. He was at, after he got out, he was in Bravo Company, then he got in stay and became a stay team leader. But he had started writing for War on the Rocks at Georgetown, and then he got a job at a little known publication called the New York Times. Mm-hmm. And um, I'd always been like, I love your writing. And he's like, well, you should do it. And I was like, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm just a redneck. <laughs> you know, I'm not a guy. And, uh, He's like, just try it, idiot. I was like, okay, and I did, and I submitted it, and that's the secret of life. I, I submitted it, and they took it, <laughs> and then I kept writing, and I liked it. I liked the creative. I love the creative, and um, just kept writing and kept writing and kept writing, and they kept taking them, you know, and um, that was a part of the uh, At War blog, and um, it was a really cool, like, creative outlet that while I'm, like, wearing, like, you know, dress socks and pocket squares, I'm over here, like, talking about deployments or, mm-hmm. you know, and at that time it was a creative outlet I was use, using to try and like stay connected to all my friends who, you know, in 2011, I lost my first friend to suicide. And, uh, I would, I just started to notice that it was something that was starting to reverberate in my community. And How'd you hear about it? Um, I was going to buy a car that day and, uh, I was in the passenger seat of my car with my wife and a friend of mine called me and it was the first call I ever got like that. And we just pulled over and just started bawling both of us. You know, Marco had, um, you know, he had, uh, he had lost his battle and yeah, that was the first one, but it wasn't the last. It just, it just, I don't know. It's, there's, it's darkness. It's pain. It's hurt. It's there. People pretend like it's not, but it, if you don't deal with it, if you're not ready, if you're not preparing, if you're not training, it comes for you. If you don't have those reps in, you Lord only knows what will happen. And, um, you know, he had been injured and he was trying to go back into the Marine Corps at one point and, um, he had like kind of waived his VA rights. So when he tried to go back in, they took back his VA benefits, um, cause you can't have those and go back in. And then he lost access to care and then it was quick. Yeah. And like, that's happening in the background of my life constantly, mm-hmm. like boom, 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 boom. And that was the first one. And then after that, I knew how the calls were. I know how they are when my phone rings. I can tell my body knows before my mind does every single time, every single time. I don't know how, but it, I do. And, you know, it just, it just kept happening. So I was like, maybe I can like put some attention towards this. Maybe if I write, maybe if I do something. And, you know, when I was with the nonprofit, I became known as, like, the veteran guy that everyone would call. Hey, I need this. Hey, I need that. We know about this. We know about that. And so I'd match my friends to organizations, resources, things that could help them. Simper Five Fund, Travis Mannion mm-hmm. Foundation, anything out there that can help them reconnect and find the community. That's what I was pushing out mm-hmm. there. 
And what made you get out a magic marker and a piece of cardboard for the first time? I was reading a book called uh, "This Money." I, know. I was um, no, I was um, the last article I wrote for the uh, New York Times was in 2018. They made um, it's called "The Marines of Marja," and it was a choose your own adventure book. And if you turn left, you would shoot. Wait, this was. A, a New York Times article? Yes. Or this was a book? This is a book that was released, and it's called The Marines of Marja. I still have one copy of it. I'll send you a photo of mm-hmm. it if you want to see it. But And it was like, choose your own adventure. Turn left. Do you engage the two enemy snipers, or do you turn right and sneak around them? Was if it you, a kid's book? Or it's like a kid's book, yeah. Um, spoiler alert. I know you might not watch it or read it, but like if you engage the enemy snipers, it ends up being two civilians, you commit a war crime, and that's what you did. And then I was like, well, I wrote an article about how I don't think we should do that. It's really hard. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to talk about this moment in time to my family and you've really kind of made this into something that it's not. And the reaction to that was they pulled the books off the line. They issued a full apology and, and, uh, they reevaluated the whole thing. Like they had a full rebuttal and they contacted the New York times and apologized for everything. And it was like, wow, there is some power in the written word. And, um, I, that again stuck with me, you know? And so I was just at home with my wife and my children during uh, the pandemic, which I know was very, very hard for so many people. And I'll never minimize that, but without a doubt, it was some of the best time of my life with my family. I had been traveling and doing things for so long and, um, that I hadn't really been able to be connected to my family and I hadn't been home continuously for that amount of time. We made a fort downstairs. We watched Justin Bieber's TV show. Like we... Did hobbies. We hung out. I put an inflatable thing in the living room for like a little bounce house for them. It was awesome. It was awesome. And um, and then I started looking online, and I was like, it's been a while since I've done something creative. And I saw these pages. It was like a dog with a sign, a CrossFitter with a sign, a Jocko with a sign, like something. It was just like whatever. And I was like, I've got cardboard, you know, like. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Got a Sharpie. Yeah. I believe in Sharpies. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and I wish there was a better origin story, like a piece of cardboard spoke to me or something. Mm-hmm. But, like, I was just, you know, I thought it was funny. It, I'm just fascinated by language and culture. In the military, we say things, and they don't they don't have the meaning the way we say them or mm-hmm. the spelling's different. You know, a pogue is a P-O-G yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, act, we have acronyms for stuff that doesn't need to exist, and we do for things that don't. Like, it's all the stuff. And I just started writing on them. And I started in March of 2020. The first one was... Uh, drink water, take Motrin, no, take Motrin, drink water and change your socks. And Mm -hmm. I was like, cure for COVID. And I was like, (laughs) I was like, I'm Shane Gillis. You know, I'm, I'm just the king of comedy right now. I'm, I'm revolutionizing this platform. And, uh, I took the photo and click and I was like, all right, that's it. I made the character, like the idea of the person is he's a, he's a veteran with the sign, but he refers himself as a war fighter, you know, and he wears, like a hat and sunglasses and he talks like this, you know, this is all like who it is, who he is in my mind. It's like me turned all the way up, turned to 11. You know what I'm saying? Like and, super Chad. Yeah. Super Chad. <laughs> I love, I love that. Yeah. And, um, and like, I just kept doing it, just kept doing it, kept doing it, kept doing it. And no one got it for a long, long time. They probably still don't get, I don't get it. Mm. But they, I, I think everybody in the military freaking gets it ASAP. Mm-hmm. They did not. At first, really? <laughs> they did not. At first, there was a lot of attention on my body and my bad tattoos. That that was like, hmm. you know, it was like Jocko one two three. Why does he wear the same thing every time? Why does he, you know, what's his tattoos? Do? This is dumb. Blah 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 blah. Like, and it kept going. It kept going. It kept going until like, um, eventually there was one that I put up. It said, "Bring back Captain Crozier." Mm-hmm. Um, he was the um, commander of the ship who got yeah. relieved when he was like, my, my ship, all my sailors have COVID. And the White House was like, no, you don't. And he's like, we, we do. We have the most COVID on the ship. Can you please help us? And they're like, no, you don't. And he's like, please. And they leaked all that stuff to the news outlets. And then there's the iconic video of him getting relieved of command and the mm. ship's just humming. Yeah. And just they're all like, Captain Crozier, boom, 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 boom. And uh, I put up the video. I mean, I put up the post that said, bring back Captain Crozier. And that was... That was one. That one got out, and this um, this uh, sailor who went on to win Sailor of the Year, Sierra, she shared it, and then people shared it, and then what happened after that is it activated like all all my old posts, and then all my old posts got love. Like it just started just windfalling and just 
just going and going and going and going <laughs> to a point to where I was like, I need to turn notifications off on my phone. This is this is just so much input. This is so radical. It's constant likes, comments, likes, follows, boom, boom, boom. And you know, since that moment, I've just been trying to keep it on the tracks and trying to like be a good advocate for the community and like. Yeah, there's been moments like I remember when I remember when you followed me. That was that was a big deal. I told, Hell yeah. dude, I told a lot of people. I told a lot of, I, dude. I remember, I remember when Tulsi followed me. Tulsi followed me, and she's like, "Hey, I want to make a sign. Can I make one?" I go, "Ma'am, you can do whatever you want. Like, you're you're one of my heroes. Are you are you kidding me? T, of course you can. Yeah." And she put a sign up. And I don't know. I would have to like, I don't even understand, or I don't think too much. I don't see a bunch of stuff, so I forget like following you i forget what triggered that or whatever there must have been some i trolled you what'd you do <laughs> um well first off i was experimenting with the platform mm -hmm. and i don't i don't feel like this table is big enough for me to have this conversation with you there's way too much distance i mean wait you're way too close i need more distance <laughs> but um i had made the navy seal joke about if you, and a few of the seals I know, like uh, Eddie, I know uh, Sean Mastin, you know, I know, I know the Latrells, and uh -huh. they're like, they're fine. I'm like, guys, I make fun of me too. Like, we're all open source. It's not derogatory. It's just a little joke, right? Uh -huh. You know, how do you know I was in the infantry? Just wait, I'll tell you. You know, what I'm, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And like, I said something. It was just me in black and white, and I'm holding up a sign that says "good." And right I was like, everyone let Jocko know. And then they <laughs> tagged you so many times that he just wrote something. And I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? <laughs> you know? And like, it was just this thing where like it shifted from like jokes and memes to like, oh, I might need to be careful here. What What is my goal? And it was pushing back to my goal of like, now that you're here, look at this, get some help. Hey, you're a veteran looking for some some way to plug into the community? Check out Travis Manion Foundation. They're doing great things all over the country, making sure people are connected to the community and mm -hmm. being advocates for change. Or what about this organization, Vets, that helps veterans with psychedelic treatment, Semper Fi Fund, Gary Sneeze Fund. The list goes on and on and on and on. But I can't I can't talk about that. That's my message. If you talk about the same thing over and over, you'll get suppressed isn't the right word. It just won't reverberate. It just won't be out there. So it's mixed in there, kind of like three card money, and it's the ace. You know, where's the ace? And I'm mixing it up. Mm. It's a meme. It's a joke. It's whatever. That's the ace. That's the thing I'm trying to pull you back to. Mm -hmm. You know. And so, what has this turned into? Like, it's got. It's, it's kind of like I see other people with signs yeah. on yeah. your page. What's that all about? Anyone who can do it can do it. If anyone wants to have a message, I want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. It can't just be me. I want it to be everyone. I, mm -hmm. I want to open source it. You know, like I said, like Tulsi's done it. Uh, a lot of influencers have done it. People I know have done it. I'm gonna have to. I want you to do it. Will you do it? Uh, I probably won't hold up a cardboard sign with a magic marker writing on it. But we'll, I'm sure we can figure something out. <laughs> That's a yes. You heard it here on Jocko. <laughs> he said yes. Uh, thanks, man. Let me see one of these knives real quick. Um, no. Um, well, no, so the idea is that the warfighter, the veteran with a sign is anyone. It's anyone who wants to say something. I've expanded it beyond just like veterans. I want cops, police to say it. Like the California Highway Patrol sends me stuff. They're like, stop speeding and, you know, stop texting and driving. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll, like, I'll upload that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I just want it to be a message. And like, to me, I'm experimenting with the platform in the sense of like, uh, I want it to be something where it's not just the word, but also maybe your outfit's a part of the message or maybe the background's part of the message. Like, you know, recently um, I went to SHOT Show and the NSSF reached out to me and they're like, we're doing a push for mental health. We want you to come out and do it. And I was like, done. Mm -hmm. I'm in. And so it's just me at SHOT Show holding up cardboard signs talking about their you know, their mental health uh, push. And it's just things like that. And so I'm trying to be that disruptor to where I can normalize the military experience and you know I'm gonna be a good advocate for mental health yeah. and stuff. One thing I like about it's remember old Twitter, mm -hmm. Echo Charles, where you can only have 140 characters. Oh, well, wasn't it like 70? No, it's 140. That? Then it became 280. Oh, okay. And then now you can do whatever you want. Okay, all right. Elon well, just cool. got crazy. Yeah, you know. Okay. Which there was there's an argument for that as well, but there was something about 140 characters that was kind of cool. Yeah. All oh, right. And 
what I like about the, th- the what you do is I don't know how many words you can, but it's like twenty is the most. Yeah, and it, oh, yeah. my hand cramps, and I'm just like I yeah. hate the way it looks. I try to go twelve to fifteen. So, so that's pretty cool when you've got to be concise with your message, concise enough that you can get it on a piece of cardboard that easily, and it's working, man, because people are reading those things, myself included. Yeah, it's. It's fun to work with the the platform and and the thing, and so I've changed it into what I'm doing to get like multiple images where it's like a flip book. The, it's called a carousel is what the type of post is where mm-hmm. you go slide one, slide two, slide three. Mm-hmm. And so that's I'm expanding on, but like I noticed there was a gap in the conversations that I wanted to have and the things that I was saying. So like I was like, well, I'm in my 30s, I'm a veteran time to start a podcast. Like that's literally like where it's like expanded into because like, I've noticed this community. <laughs> you like that? Jack, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, well, it's it just becomes like I wanted to have like a deeper connection um, and to really like you're just limited. I was just limited yeah. in what I was able to say. Yeah. Like, um, like one of the things I say, and uh, it was hard to expand on, and so I've tried to constantly expand on it now, is like post-traumatic stress disorder to me is when you come to the realization that the memory of who you were is better than the reality that you are. And when that happens, it's almost impossible not to hate yourself because you remember who you were before the trauma, before the event, and then you see where you are afterwards, the wreckage, the damage, whatever you want to call it. When you see that, it hurts. And the only way to really kind of undo that, in my opinion, is to talk about it and to normalize it, not in a way where it's like traumatic towards an individual or other people listening, but you really just got to kind of humanize the whole thing. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And um, I saw how limited I was with that and like more of my connections to these types of um, expansions of this universe, whatever you want to call it, it was just kind of limited to like DMs and stuff from like me connecting people to resources. And so I was like, let's push this in a different way. And so I, I just started a podcast mm-hmm. on it because I, I, I'm i loquacious, I guess. I just want to talk. <laughs> and this is this is the After Action podcast, right? Yes, sir. And how's it going? You it's, like it? I like it. People trust me uh, with their stories, and it's hard. It's, it's very, very hard. Um, you know, in Nashville, there was a, an incident with a, um, a school shooter, mm-hmm. and um, I was able to connect to uh, both the off- all the officers there, but the two in particular that, that, that took the shooter down, and one of them is a fellow Marine, Michael Colazzo, and we became friends, and over the course of however a year, I, you know, we, we still hang, we hang out all the time and he, I've always texted him and stuff, but like, he's like, I want to tell this story. And I was like, well, okay. You know, and I was like, I'll help you. I'll push you, not push you. I'll, I'll help find a place where you can feel comfortable telling your story mm-hmm. and got connected to a few people. And he, he just didn't feel comfortable about it. And then eventually he just sat down and he goes, why don't we do it? And I go, I'm, I don't, I've, I've never done this. I don't know how it'll go, you know? And he's like, well, I want to do it. And he trusted me with it, and so we did. We tell, we sat down and we told that story, and you know, it's taught me a lot about myself and others, and you know, and people trust me in the moment because I try to take a, a, a lighthearted approach and a humanizing approach to the things that we've been through and the people that I've talked to, and you know, everyone that's been a part of it's someone that's uh, had a very big impact on my life, and you know, it, it takes time, obviously, as you know, but like, I learned so much from it. Like every time I get up, I'm like, man, that was. That was cool. Like the opposite of what I'm doing to y'all. Like I'm taking from y'all. But like, <laughs> well, no, because like Gunny, Brian Walgren told me this. The most important thing we have in life is time. And when someone gives that to you, you cherish that, you understand that, you respect it. Because you can never give it back, but they gave it to you. So I try to do that. Does that get us up to speed? Is that where we're at right now? Kind of. I still can't believe I'm here. I still can't believe, I literally can't believe I'm here. I literally can't believe I'm here. You know, cause it's, it's just, it's no one more than me is fascinated by the fact that 14 years ago I was in Marja and then jump cut, COVID happens. I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm just writing a joke about Navy SEALs. Oh yeah, Navy SEALs write books. And I'm sitting across from one of the most well-known Navy SEALs ever. You, Charlie Sheen, Dick Marcinko, you're the most well-known Navy SEALs ever. And, uh, you know, and, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. And like now we're here to a place where we're talking about this and like I just um you know I I there was a moment where I wanted to quit all of it all of it and it's when 
you know, it was in, it was in June of 2020 when my, when my best friend took his life. Mike, Mike took his life. And, uh, I was like, what am I doing? You know, if that happens, what am I doing? What is this for? Am I ever going to affect change? And, um, he knew everything I was doing. He knew everything I was, I could have helped him with and all the stuff that was available to him. And to be honest, if anyone could have got a green light to where I'll put pressure on relationships that might hurt them to save him, wouldn't have blinked. And he knew that. And, uh, you know, he just, he, 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 um, he wasn't able to come home. And, you know, after Marja, he was just never the same. And when I think about why I still do this stuff now, why I push so hard, I think about fighting for him, right? I think about what I need to do to make sure that I don't put anyone in the round next to him. That's why I keep going. That's literally it. I'm tired. I, I would really love to like kind of fall back and get into like a statesman position to be like, I used to be on the internet. That was cool back then. Now I'm just, I'm just a dad. I'm just a cheer dad. I'm just a husband. I'm just a father. You know, I don't have any promo codes. I'm not here to, you know, I'm just a guy, but I feel, I feel like it's my final mission to fight, to fight, to make sure that people know they're worth it. And so that's, that's literally it. That's what keeps me going. And, um, you know, he's, he's a person that was so important to me that when I got the, when I found out I was coming here, I would have called him. I would have called him. Just be like, hey, guess what? He has this thick Boston accent. Be like, what's that kid? You know, he talks like Ben Affleck and Matt Damon is what he sounded like. And, uh, you know, that's why I'm still doing this stuff now. Because I feel like I'm in this place of, I'm in this place where I'm supposed to be the one to, to show that there is, there is, uh, there is peace beyond the battlefield and that it's worth it and that you're worth fighting for. Yeah, you're spreading that message, man. Um, yeah, veteranwithasign.com. That's where people can find you. Mm -hmm. you're, you're on Instagram and Facebook, at veteranwithasign. You're not on Twitter. I am, but that's my name. I haven't made like a veteran with a sign brand. Oh. It's just Zachary Ebell. I would recommend you do that. You know, just in case, man, you gotta, you know. Yeah, cover the bases. Cover I'm the on bases. TikTok. Are you on TikTok? No. Uh, you will be really. soon. <laughs> uh, there's someone that, there's someone that like takes my stuff. Yeah. That I know. Yeah. That takes my stuff and reposts it and re repurposes it. Yeah. Uh, through TikTok. Yeah. But that, but I don't actually have it like for myself. Yeah. And you know, you were asking me like, do I actually do all my social media? And the answer is yes, I do it all. So I can't really do that with TikTok because it's such a invasive um, uh, platform or whatever app. It's porous is what, is what, if you just say a few words in it, you'll see whatever you want to see and they'll serve up ads to you. It's mm -hmm. very, cool. very porous. It's security is what I'll say. Interesting. Leaky. Sure. Yeah. Um, but right on, man. Uh, Echo Charles. Yeah. Uh, just you got any the, questions? Yeah. Please. With the, uh, just with the signs and stuff because yeah. I've seen a few of them. Yes, and did, did you see the jujitsu one before? No. Okay, so there's a like jujitsu jiu one. jujitsu guy with a sign? His name's, yeah. His name's Ian Funk, grappler with a sign. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you that's guys all one. know each other kind of. He's a, he's a Marine, so he's a Marine, Corps, he's a Marine Corps veteran. Everyone should check out grappler with a sign. He says some of the best stuff ever. I, I did jujitsu for many years. I had a... I had a reconstructive nose surgery and then all the, I wasn't able to get into it. I mean, Echo were talking about this earlier. Like I was able to work, wasn't able to work out for like three months and then six months before I could roll and then COVID happened and I need to go back to it, but I'm terrified of breaking my nose again. Mm -hmm. Cause I was, I, I had sleep apnea because of it. Mm -hmm. It was bad. But, yeah. um, Ian's a great guy. Um, grapple with the sign. I love what he talks about. Cause like they're so motivational and like, He's somewhere in California. Are they inside jokes too? Yes. Okay. So that yeah. so that's the whole thing. Yeah. And I was and it's I language. do have a question yeah. a little bit um, just ahead. to kind of confirm. But yeah. So at first, and I'm so actually I'm gonna have to admit it to you. I like you a lot, so I'll be honest. Okay, go ahead. I kind of got you mixed up with him. That's fine. Oh so, dang. Oh, yeah, because it was. But it's, you're right. Grappler with a sign. Yeah. 
So anyway, but it's you just figured deal. that out like right now. No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Before, before, like a few days ago, <laughs> you saw both of our abs, and you're like, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't that I'm funny. <laughs> no, but bro, that's the whole premise, right? Is yes. the signs are funny. It's mm-hmm. like it's almost yeah. like, but there's an actual format to it, right? Yes. Like you can't just say anything that's funny. It has to fit that with a sign thing, almost as if to say. Hey, I don't know who needs to hear this and has a slight tinge of obviousness to yeah. it almost, you yeah. know, kind of like some people might not know this or might be ignoring this message kind yeah. of a thing, you know, and there's a few different, different kind of like, do you have a format there, that you're like, man, you're breaking, the, you're breaking this down Barney style, as they say. Yes. Yeah, so a, the, it, everything I do is like with a wink and a smile, right? Yeah. So every Navy still writes a book. Yeah. Wink, smile. Yeah. You know, um, it's all in that, like, cause it has to engage and be something that's like shareable yeah like so because when people share stuff they're trying to say something like i feel this way echo feels this way blank so it has to it's it's almost like it's so powerfully relatable yes like Um, where it's like i'm gonna break it down for you Mm. it's a handwritten meme Stop, stop, cut this part. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Yes. So the it's way a to handwritten c- meme. The way to create virility, viral nature is to make a meme. And so it is a handwritten meme. And the term is evergreen content, meaning I can make it 24 7, 365. It'll have application to it. There are a few like standouts, like holiday stuff. Like yeah. I'll put up every Christmas, every, uh, <laughs> it's a list of all the Christmas episodes from the office, mm. stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, Veterans Day, Marine Corps birthday, you know, national holiday. Days, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Those things I'll put up, but like, yeah, it is a handwritten meme. That's really yeah. what it is. And really, if you think about this, because I think of a lot of the veteran with a sign, a lot of the things that you put up on a sign mm-hmm. would be the kind of stuff like if you went in the in the freaking head on a ship. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like someone would write that shit on the freaking mirror <laughs> yeah. or on the freaking you yeah. know stall wall or something like that. Yeah. yeah, it's the kind of stuff that would go on a bathroom wall in the military specifically, or in a jujitsu gym. Like the kind of stuff where someone would write that kind of grappler with a sign. Yeah. So it, and what if you think about what those are? Those are the kind of things that they're one-liners from like a conversation where somebody says something and everybody knows yeah. <laughs> kind of yeah. that they're right. Yep. And it could be that they're right and they're funny. It could also be that they're right and we need to think about this more. Yes. So yes. it's it's a really cool format for communication in oh, my yeah. opinion. Y'all right, should that, talk y'all should talk to him. Like he's he's such a good dude. Like And he was in the Marine Corps? He was in the Marine Corps. He was in the Marines. It's funny, his bio says I'm not veteran with a sign, but I am a veteran with a sign. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, okay. Even so, that right there, yeah. 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 So, so right I, I love that he's getting his flowers right now because he's he's such a dude. But yeah, it's like he has what was the one about you know, uh remember when you were a white belt, I think is one of his mm-hmm. and I was like, yeah. Dude, like, cause like, you know, as you get, we're all jujitsu guys here. I mean, but y'all are, I did it for a while. I don't take claim to it anymore, but like, there is a moment when you're like pure white belt mode and then like you settle down and you're like, oh, okay. There's, this is chess, not checkers. Right. You know, yeah. we got to settle down instead of being like arm bar, arm bar, arm bar. (laughs) Like you're just hunting arm bars forever. Oh yeah. Instead you're like understanding the art, the gentle arts of Mm -hmm. the. Of the smother his best not well um, she has a lot of good ones but one that i've that i always remember is just and it has to do with the whole format of it and mm-hmm. it just it's just, just a big sign it's the one actually i got turned on to him from mm-hmm. it said you're the restaurant mm. oh, you know oh damn. man yeah. it's so funny damn. <laughs> because yeah. bro i'm telling you like okay how many restaurant you know it's it's not obvious when you're the restaurant all the time but every Actually, once in a while, yeah. if someone points it out, you're like, wait a second, bro, wait. I'm the restaurant in this room right Girl, here. You know, kind a of a thing. Feeling, anyway, man. it really landed down. That was, he's no, good. I love what he does. And he's even done things to like change the format as Instagram like prioritizes videos. So like now he'll slide in and put on sunglasses and then hold the sign up. And I'm yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> like yeah, I, yeah, I, I liked yeah. it. I like that because like, you know, there's, there's plenty of content and stuff to go around. I just liked it. Again, I'm trying to be an advocate for my community and he's a part of my community. He's, we're all a part of that community too that he's advocating for. But like again, like he's taking something that's kind of scary, a jiu-jitsu community, which is like combat grapplers mm-hmm. and making it like fun and a, you know, like lowering the barrier to entry that way more people understand it and more people understand it than they want to connect to it. And like that's what I'm trying to do as well. He's just doing it for his in the best way. Yeah. Grappler Respect. with a sign, check it out. Yeah. Man, it's good to meet you. And oh dude, I I I love this. Right on. <laughs> Right on. Zach, any closing thoughts, man? No, I, I, I just want to say, uh, again, thank you both so much for having me here. It's it's an honor and a privilege. And, you know, um, and if anyone else is out there looking for hope or needs any help, just know that you should stay because you're worth fighting for. Right on, man.
that's a, that's an awesome message and thanks for thanks for joining us thanks for flying all the way out here and sharing your experiences and your lessons learned obviously thanks for your service in the marine corps thank you um you and your you and your fellow marines absolutely upheld the proud fighting tradition of the marine corps and you know finally thanks for what you're doing today and continuing to help veterans get through what they went through it's appreciated bro thank, thank you, you. And with that, Zach Bell has left the building. Cool. Good thing to think about. There's a law of combat leadership. Yeah. Keep things simple. Simple, clear, concise communication. Yeah. And you can see that's what Zach Bell is out there doing. Simple, clear, concise communication. That lands. Yeah. And those messages resonate, help connect people with people also help keep people on the path. So here's a, here's one additional, maybe the main one. It's okay. like the, the nugget of value for, for veteran with a sign. Mm-hmm. And just that whole idea. So it's like, again, remember how I was, I was trying to analyze it. Like, what's, what's up with this thing? Why is this so catchy? Why do I want to see the next one? The next one, the next one, right? Because they're relatable. Fully in the game. But here, so here's with the, the people with a sign. But, oh, yeah. Big time. Okay. And this is why. Because, you know, and maybe not every single one is like this, but one of them, you know, after a few of them, you're going to be like, okay, cool. And you're going to get this where, you know, we go through life, you know, we're on auto a lot of the time. Sometimes we're making our cool little pivots and decisions and making things happen for sure. But every once in a while you get a, this small little nugget. It's almost like in passing. You get this little nugget. It's like a little reminder or a little like, hey, like a little like, hey, wake up real quick. And like a little heads up. And that's what those do sometimes. Mm-hmm. And it works and it lasts. You know what I'm saying? A little perspective. I think it's a, it makes you re-examine a little perspective or reignites the knowledge of a particular thing. Reignites the knowledge. Yeah. yeah. You know? You're like, yeah, that's a good point. That is a good point. And it's also interesting that you can get humor mm-hmm. and you can get pondering mm. you can get other emotions we'll say yeah it's not all just oh this is funny because yeah. you can read some of them and you can say oh yeah that makes me think oh yeah that makes me remember yeah. oh yeah that makes me sad yeah using a positive way yeah like a positive way of being sad yeah positive way of remembering so that's what we're doing zach bell out there um keeping people on the path speaking of the path yeah. If you're on the path, you're probably working out. I hope. Look, let me rephrase that. You're working out. We're working out. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. When we work out, we need fuel. We recommend Jocko Fuel. Now, you were telling me before we started recording today that you had drifted off the path in one specific way and you started to feel it. Yeah. Joint 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 warfare. Joint warfare. Joint warfare. That's a thing, man. It is. And look, we're not. How many times you got to learn this lesson? Bro, I know, right? Here's the thing. I do, you you ask that question kind of like kind of teasing or whatever, mm-hmm. but it's that's even as a micro scolding right there like that's warranted <laughs> because it is it's like I'm not learning the lesson you know like where you get on it okay our problem hey we're rolling good yeah. you know joints all this going hard and still you're kind of good you get off it and it because it doesn't happen right away no. you know a month two months I maybe think, you hit it hard. Yeah. And then boom, you're back in the hurt locker as far as like the joints and you're like, oh, oh. and then you kind of, it's almost like you forget that you're off it. That's my, that's my experience. I need to make a sign for you (laughs) that says, take your joint warfare, son. Cause that's the deal. Hey, we're back on it. But I did. And actually I took this advice that you gave me years ago, Mm -hmm. by the way. And I'm finally taking it where I just staged the actual joint warfare into my morning thing, which it was successfully I achieved the morning routine of creatine and hydrate mm-hmm. in the morning, every single morning mm-hmm. with a cup of water, by the way, that's yeah, right That's there. way more complicated, by the way. I think so. Yeah. 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 Then just, just put the three drink. joint warfare. It's true. I put the whole bottle right there. It's mm-hmm. just part of the little lineup. See what I'm saying? Where did you keep it before? This doesn't even make sense to me. Okay. Not that we need to go too deep into it, but we will. You like, asked. There's no possible way in my mind I could want to do something like take joint warfare mm-hmm. and not stage it within eight inches of my toothbrush yeah that makes sense <laughs> it's just and like that's not even now. feasible you're right and i get it but when you really think of the reality of my routine mm-hmm. it 
makes sense. Not that it's right, but it makes more sense than not. So this is how it is. Real quick. I sleep upstairs. Mm -hmm. All that stuff is downstairs in what we call a pantry. Wait, you don't keep joint warfare and super krill in your bathroom where you brush your teeth? Uh Uh-uh. It's it's always been in the pantry. I'm not the only one who takes this stuff. You need to... It, There's right. a whole bunch of adjustments hey, you're, you need to make. <laughs> you're correct. I agree. Like your mind is not functioning properly. Yeah, I hate to say this. Look, I just haven't evaluated the system in a yeah. in a way that's ultimately conducive to where we want to be. I mm-hmm. get it. It's it's there now for sure. Everything was in the pantry. Is okay. what I'm saying. Everything, even because yeah. I don't take everything every day. Yeah. When you know when the stuff right. gets you want to keep away. milk in the in the pantry. That's cool. It is in the pantry because yeah, it should be because that's a food. That's when you're hungry. Yeah. But you don't have joint warfare. Or super krill, yeah. or time war when you're hungry. I would be interested to see how many people have joint warfare and or krill oil in the pantry and not in the bathroom or wherever you you know. <laughs> it's a low number, bro. Uh, people are smarter than this. Uh, you might be right, <laughs> and that might have been a kind of a backhand. Hey, well, scenario. it doesn't even matter now because I'm one of those people now. So yeah. boom, it's uh, all in the okay. lineup in the thing. Boom, mm-hmm. good to go. Mm-hmm. GTG. So yeah, we're all good to go. All right. Yep. Hey, if you want to get some joint warfare, so you can roll, work out, lift, train. And not feel like you're 8,000 years old. Get yourself some joint warfare. Get some time war too, by the way. Are we still doing the 100 burpees thing? Or is that kind of like part we of We did a, it. Okay. Listen, I have not been consistent with it, but it is now 100% part of my jam. Okay, sweet. Like, like it is, it is in the, it's in the mix. It's oh. in the mix. So, like today, I didn't do it yet. I mean, it. I lifted, of course, yeah. Yeah. but I didn't do it yet, but it's in the mix. It's in the thing. So does it need to be? Do I need? Maybe I need to. Maybe it just needs to be. That's the protocol. Yeah. You know, just daily. Right. And I'll tell you what, I have a, a hill that I sprint. Okay. It's in the middle of my, so when I go for a run, there's a hill that I sprint. In the middle of the running course. Yeah, so we'll I'm, I'm running, you know, it's like a few miles of running. It's the daily run, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a, a hill, good little hill. Yeah, yeah. Not, nothing major, but it's steep. You know, it's kind of that kind of hill. And when you run it, you know, I always hit the timer at the bottom, so I kind of just know how hard I'm putting out. And sometimes it'll take, you know, 56 seconds, 54 seconds. But when you're doing good, you can get in, you know, you're down to 49, you're down to 48. And so I just, you know, I've been on the road a bunch, so I hadn't run that course. But during Def Reset, I was doing that 100 burpees every day regardless. Mm -hmm. And I just did the run, did the hill, 42 seconds. Oh, better. Better like than the normal. Bur- the burpees help the running. The burpees the definitely help the run huh. without as That's much good. running as normal. Huh. Yeah. So so that when I did that, and I actually was mentally prepared for like a 58 second, you yeah. know, like a bad time because I hadn't been running because I'd yeah. been on the road. Yeah. The burpees. Yeah. The burpees huh. came through. Like little, like it's like a supplementation. Yeah. I actually exercise. knew a guy who was in the SEAL teams. He was one of my instructors. And you know what an eight count bodybuilder is? Yeah. Yeah. So he said that he was on a submarine for like three months Mm. as a SEAL. And he did some crazy number. Something like a thousand eight count bodybuilders a day. Yeah. Damn. And when he got off, he was the fastest he'd ever been. For real? Yeah. So I think I I hit a similar scenario. Yeah. It's like... Yeah, it's weird that yeah, every once in a while you can stumble upon those routines that helps mm-hmm. like these other routines, you yeah. know? And the mental benefit that I learned from doing 100 burpees regardless of anything else yeah. and pushing, you know, I really, I, it was just a daily exercise of turning your mind off and going hard, yeah. which, is a, which is two different things that yeah. you need to learn how to do simultaneously. Yep, turn off your mind and go hard at the same time. Yeah. If you want to get better at that, do 100 burpees a day yeah. as fast as you can. Yeah. You know, we hit the stopwatch and then go. Yeah. It's a thing. Yeah. It'll that, help you out. It's, yeah, it's so true. And 100 burpees, that's like such a good standard for that. Because it's, let's face it, like it's not going to kill you. Like nope. it's not a death defying, nope. you know, nope. little routine. But it's not nothing. Nope. Bro, when you go out there, you got to get your mind right. Go you hard, know, yeah. To kind of thing. It's not nothing. So, yes, you're correct. Um Here's another one to throw in there just for the mix. I okay. know people like little routines. Yeah, this yeah, one's yeah. anywhere between 10 and 15 minutes. Okay. And a little long, but go ahead. Yeah. So you do need. It's a little. 15 minutes is is a little bit harder to throw in just into the mix. I'm just saying 10 minutes. Yeah. You can throw into the mix. 
seven minutes and 30 seconds for 100 burpees. That's yeah. in the mix real easy. So this is different than, okay, than so the 100 burpees. It's... So, you know, I do a little Metcon. Sometimes mm -hmm. it takes six minutes, seven mm -hmm. minutes, or whatever. So what I did was I combined it. The same Metcon, I just do more reps. So I just do four of these, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, there's reps, sets, rounds. Mm -hmm. right? So you got clean and jerk mm -hmm. with 60% of your body weight. So in my yeah. case, that is one, one. I do dumbbells. So I do 260 mm -hmm. pound dumbbells, okay. right? And then I go straight from there to jumping jacks, straight from jumping jacks to burpees. And How many jumping jacks are you doing? Um, okay. Are you doing it for time or what? No, no, yeah, kind of both. So, so jumping jacks and then burpees and then sit-ups, right? Like kind of like. Okay. Okay. So those four exercises, right? Okay. So for the, for the clean and jerk, 10. Mm -hmm. Jumping jacks, 30. Four Burp, count? No, regular one. Two. Yeah, no, not okay. not the four okay. count, just regular. Okay. So ten clean and jerks, thirty jumping jacks, mm -hmm. ten burpees, twenty sit ups. No one holding your feet or nothing okay. like that. You know the kind of like as if you were playing like butterfly guard sit up guard mm -hmm. or something like okay. that. So boom, that's it. That's one round. You do four rounds of that with under one minute rest. That's the thing. You don't want to go over a minute rest. Okay. The faster the better for sure. But you don't want to go one minute rest, bro. That's a good one. Yeah. It's like right on the edge where it's like when you're feeling like really, 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 really good, mm -hmm. you can go like you can do it all. But if you're like kind of slacking, you're like at a minute mm -hmm. rest, you know, kind of a thing. But it's solid. That one's a good one. Okay. Try that one. Well, there you go. You got a couple options out there. Yep. And if you need to rebuild yourself when you're done, get some milk protein, get yourself some hydrate. Hydrate's so good. Hydrate's another thing that'll uh, satisfy your sweet tooth straight up. Yeah, it's you know like a I mean? drink. It's, oh, yeah, it's, it's like, like a soft drink. It, yeah, it's a kind soft of. drink. Uh, yeah. But it's going to replace the sweat that you have. It's got it's got vitamin C in there. So that's what we're doing. Check it out. JockoFuel.com. Get what you need. Also, you can go to Wawa. You can go to Vitamin Shop, GNC, AFES, Military Commissaries, uh, Hannaford, Dash Stores, Wake Fern, ShopRite, HEB down in Tejas, Meyer. Harris Teeter, Lifetime, Lifetime Fitness, that is. Shields, and, and look, small gyms. You got a small gym, or if you go to a small gym, or you go to a big gym. I mean, let's face it, Lifetime Fitness. Have you ever been to one of those? Life, yeah, I have. They're freaking Actually. monstrous, yeah. monstrous gyms. Or maybe you go to a CrossFit gym, hey, wherever you go. Ask them if they can get some Jocko Fuel in there to help you out on your path. Email jfsales at jockofuel.com. That's what we're doing. Also, you're gonna need some gear on your journey, get some American-made gear. Don't support slavery. No, don't. Do you know what's weird is, if you if you went to a thousand people and said, does anyone here support slavery? In America, you'd get zero hands going up. Right. And yet, what are they doing with their dollar bills? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, unknowingly, sometimes even knowingly, mm -hmm. and sometimes you kind of shrug your shoulders, like, well, what can I do? You know, well, hey, do you support slavery? No. Well, where do you spend your money? Oh, it's on a bunch of stuff that's made in China. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're, you do support sla slavery. And you may shrug your shoulders like, well, what am I supposed to do? I'll tell you what you're supposed to do. OriginUSA.com. That's what you're supposed to do. You go to OriginUSA.com and you order something that's made in America. Where the cotton was grown in America. Where the rivets on the jeans were made in America, where the zippers made in America, where the Velcro is made in America, where everything's made in America, and then it's sewn together in America. That's what we're doing. OriginUSA.com. Get boots. Get jeans. And we're getting dialed, man. We we we've brought on board. There's something called a pattern maker. Mm. When you make clothing, mm. this is a critical role. So what is that? The pan what the is pattern the pattern? Maker. So if you take like the, the panels yes, of Yes, the like panels of the whatever the thing is. But imagine, I mean, it's we take it for granted, right? Yes. Like, oh, it's just a t-shirt, it's just yes. a pair of jeans, just a pair of pants. You just take it for granted. Yeah. You don't actually think about the geometry of how that thing curves around someone's body. And it's a huge difference. And by it's the way. a huge difference. So we've got pattern. We we some of these big companies, iconic, sure. formerly American made companies. Mm-hmm that now make their stuff in China, even though they're iconic American brands, they make their stuff in China now. But they still, the knowledge is here in America for how to set up the patterns. So guess what we did? We hired them. They're with us now. 
they walked away from the disgusting businesses that they were forced to be at because they didn't have a choice. Now they have a choice. You know what they want to do? They want to make stuff in America. These are people that come from the background. These are people that grew up in this industry. And they had to watch factories get moved overseas. And so finally, they have an option. They have an option. And so we've got the best people in the world with so much experience, so much experience. They like look at your genes when they're like, oh, they're like, they know what's up. Yeah. So that, that's what we're doing, originusa.com. We got everything you need. Jiu-Jitsu geese, jeans, boots, hoodies, hunt gear, t-shirts, got a jean jacket. Did you see my jean jacket? I did, yeah. yes, respect. <laughs> What's up now? Bro, you look, What's up now? You looked right at home in that jean, bro, ja- come jean jacket, bro. You come looked, on. No, bro, you look good. So, originusa.com, check it out. Yep, it's true. Also, Jocko's a store called Jocko Store. Discipline equals freedom. Mm-hmm. That's a for real, for real it's thing. A for real thing. You want to represent t shirts, hats, hoodies, that kind of stuff. That's where you go, jockostore.com. Um, also, we have the shirt locker on Jocko Store. That's a new shirt, new, new design yeah. every month. Little subscription scenario. I got a good one coming next. Oh, month. you do? Man. What's the give us the general this general background? So this idea that you said or okay. referred to donuts as sugar coated lies. Mm-hmm. So that one was a hard one to kinda like reconcile. Like I'm not gonna well, you know, we're here here at Jocko Store. It's kinda hard to pull off okay, I'm going to make a donut with mm-hmm. a Ghostbusters X through it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, so I don't know. Some real obvious choices you could have made. Yeah, you but know, and I don't I'm know. I'm assuming you didn't go obvious. We didn't do that one, no. You stepped it up. Because, I look, I see, bro, when we go to these musters and stuff like that, bro, I see mass representation and mm-hmm. people looking good. Like, sure, they're cool, they're clever, they got layers, but the, the designs actually look good. For real. <laughs> it, like, when you're wearing the thing. So think about this. Uh, you know the, okay, when you see me wearing the SOG shirt, for example, yeah. the SOG support yeah, shirt. Yeah. I was not in SOG, you know that about yeah, me. Neither was I. I wouldn't no. wear a SOG shirt, I wasn't in SOG. You can't. But do I support SOG? Yeah. You're damn right I do. Yeah, so we have one of the early shirt locker shirts is a SOG support shirt. When you seen it, you were like, that's kind of dope. How could you not? Now, there's certain designs that look good maybe on paper or look good in your head or seem whatever, but when they put it on a shirt, you put it on your mm-hmm. on your person, as it were. Yeah. It doesn't match, yeah. right? So it, I don't know if I could see someone like kind of representing a big donut with an X through. I don't know. Maybe, mm-hmm. I don't know. I could be wrong, but it just didn't seem, seem odd. That was not mm-hmm. obvious to me, but I think I got something. Sure. That's the difference, man. That's... <laughs> Dude. That's like the third measure right there. <laughs> it really is. Anyway, so, all right. Anyway, that's called the short locker. It's on jockostore.com. So yeah, check that out if you like check. it. Get it. Also, primalbeef.com, coloradocraftbeef.com. These are two places that are giving you steak. Well, they're not giving it to you. You got to pay for it, but you're going to get paid back. It's worth it. In taste, in health, and in supporting awesome American brands. ColoradoCraftBeef.com or PrimalBeef.com. Great people, great companies, great freaking steak. That's what we're doing. Subscribe to the podcast. You guys know that. And Jocko Underground. Check that out, JockoUnderground.com. Also, we have a YouTube channel. Check it out. Um, Like, click, and subscribe. But we don't really like. Was that what we're doing? Hey, <laughs> do, do, do what you dig. But yeah, subscribe like, for click sure. And subscribe. I'm. Uh, we might be doing actually with. How many? Are, how often does someone hear like, click, and subscribe that they go, "Oh, I'm gonna like this. I'm gonna click it. I'm gonna subscribe it." How often does that happen? Uh, yeah. If you're not a kid, and no, you can go next level to like, what is it? Uh, notifications. Turn on notifications. Oh, yeah, like, there's a whole on. bunch of layers you can go. Yeah, for sure. I think it's like pretty soon it's gonna be sure. hey. Click here to have Elon put a neural link in your brain so the YouTube things come yeah. right into your head. It actually works with like new internet users and kids because like my one when I went through that stint of allowing my daughter to be on mm-hmm. electronics, mm-hmm. it's not anymore, thankfully. But nonetheless, yeah. she was on there, and this is one of the reasons where she would like she would like stuff. Oh, you know, because yeah. it says, "Hey, it's because it really makes it." When I try to look at look at it objectively, mm-hmm. but it kind of makes you feel like, "Oh, yeah, that's what we're doing." By the way, like, yeah, mm-hmm. like, like, click and so, or like, it's like, 
share dude i'm the hard, i'm the hardest person to like convey to do stuff oh yeah because you're you and i get it man of course <laughs> but i'm saying you know new new yeah, users yeah, yeah. they'll be like oh yeah. okay i guess i guess that's what we're sort yeah. of doing on here you know kind of thing anyway sure well yeah. hey look we have a youtube channel hey if you don't want to subscribe to it don't don't have to don't like it don't subscribe to it but at least check it out, get some info if you need it. <laughs> yes, and we we will be coming out with a Jocko uh, Shorts channel, like a separate channel for shorts. Oh. It won't be on the only, like mm. all the shorts, but like it'll Wait, be a now, separate channel. is this channel. a separate, um, like a separate uh, entire YouTube channel, or is it just like a playlist inside of YouTube? Right now it's a playlist, okay. but it'll be a separate channel. Look at from, you. From what I understand, it's like, you know, it's a different watching experience or whatever. So anyway, it was, it was recommended to me to do that. Oh, so be yeah. on the lookout for that. Is Look, when you all ask us for something and it makes sense and then we get asked it for it a lot, we'll, we'll try and hook it up. And apparently that's what's going down. Yes. So that's we're going to make a YouTube to put it. shorts yeah. channel. Jocko podcast shorts. That's on the link to that. So be on the lookout. Is what I'm saying. Uh, right on. Check that out. Also, Joggle Fuel has a YouTube channel. Also, Origin USA has a YouTube channel. And you can find out what's going on in all these worlds. Psychological Warfare. FlipsideCanvas.com. Dakota Meyer making cool stuff to hang on your wall. Books. I've written a bunch of books. You all know the deal. A bunch of adult books about leadership. And kids book. Kids books about how to be awesome in life. So if you know kids, get those kids these books, Way of the Warrior Kid series, also Mike and the Dragons. Uh, check out all my books, yeah, there you go. I've written a bunch of them, as we pointed out with Zach. That's a Navy SEAL thing to do, write books apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and Echelon Front, we have a leadership consultancy. If you need help inside your business or organization, go to Extreme Ownership, or sorry, go to echelonfront.com. And then if you want to do an online training, go to ExtremeOwnership.com, learn how to lead in business and life. And if you want to help service members, active and retired, you want to help their families, Gold Star families, check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got an incredible charity organization, really helping out veterans. I've seen it with my own eyes, providing them medical services that they would not get through the VA, through the traditional system. If you want to support, or you want to donate, or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. Also, heroesandhorses.org. We got Micah Fink taking, taking veterans up into the wilderness. And then finally, Jimmy May's organization, beyondthebrotherhood.org. Check that one out as well. And if you want to connect with us, Zach, he's on the interwebs. He's at, he's at veteranwithasign.com. He's also got Facebook and Instagram, at Veteran with a Sign. And he's got a podcast that he talked about briefly, which is called The After Action Podcast. So if you want to connect with Zach, that's how you do it. And if you want to connect with me and Echo, you can do that too. I'm at Jocko Willink. Echo's at Echo Charles. Just be careful, because it is a psychotic zone that you're entering that is literally designed to destroy your time, destroy it, and give you nothing in return. Gives you nothing back, you have nothing. You invest time, look, you, you invest time trying to play guitar, you're gonna get good at guitar. Yep. You'll be able to sit around the campfire mm -hmm. and kick out some jams. Yeah, yeah. You invest time into writing, you're gonna end up with documentation of the things that you wanted to express in the world. You invest time into just about anything. You invest time in working out, you're gonna get stronger. You invest time in running, you're gonna get faster. You invest time in jujitsu, you're gonna benefit in so many multitude of ways. But if you invest your time into social media, you know what you're gonna get back? Nothing. You're not getting anything back, nothing. In fact, you're gonna be a little bit, a little bit deeply nauseated by what you did. And, and, and it's going to make you feel bad. And the only thing that's going to make you feel a little bit better is if you do it a little bit more. It's a vicious circle. It's called the algorithm. We're against it. So if you want to talk to us, man, write us a letter. Send it to my gym. That'd be a better, much better way. Uh, and thanks, of course, to those of our military personnel out there. And I guess tonight, especially to the Marine Corps and a solemn salute to those that gave their lives 
in the Battle of Marja. We will not forget your sacrifice. And thanks as well to our police, law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, Border Patrol, Secret Service, and all other first responders. Thank you for your service, keeping us safe here on the home front. And everyone else out there, you, you might feel like you're alone. You might feel like you're alone sometimes, but you're not. There are other people who have gone through or are going through the same thing as you or something close or something worse. And if you need some help, reach out. If you need some help, put out a sign. Someone will answer. And also, You might not need help, but if you see someone else with a sign, maybe you're the one with the answer. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.